felt the same as Harbin, China. So we were having a big time about that. But pray for Brother Pelkey and his health. I know he's got some, some things going on. All right, glad to, glad to have the rest of you. We're kind of waiting for the Williams. Now, I'm not, we're going to not wait for our, to start, but we're waiting for the Williams family and uh, missionaries uh, to... Uh, Japan, cool. and uh, they haven't come yet, so pray for them. I hope they didn't get stuck and get discouraged down here in all this uh, construction zone. Is that Brother Dustin? Yes. Yes. Dustin Williams is yes. going to be here? Well, they called and said they would. So uh, pray for them, all right? And others may be coming in yet. So Brother Don will lead us. You know what? Okay. As long as we go through the head of and we actually sing it at almost every church we go to if they let us sing. Just tell me the story of Jesus. Amen. One of the reasons we picked that one is I like to encourage people. If do you, does anyone ever get tired if the preacher comes up or and this, you go visit a church or the preacher just talk about giving the gospel and just tell the story of Jesus again? Like I already know that story. If it ever gets tired to, tiring to you, there's a problem. Amen. You should, we should be so excited about it that we can't help but love to hear it and can't help but love to share it. So, with that in mind, just sing 201 of the or hymnals. You probably already know it. Tell me, tell me the story of Jesus. Amen. Song 201. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in court. 
David had to be out for a little while, so I'm glad Brother Don was here. He does a good job. Amen. Uh, I was telling the church yesterday that uh, when I, the first night of the camp meeting in Lipa City, uh, I was expecting the, there were there were above 400 folks there, and, and the church gets up, uh, the whole church gets up and is the choir for the camp meeting. And they've got their they've got their children with them. They got babies in the arms. You know, moms got their babies with them. They get up and sing. Well, I was expecting to see some, you know, to hear some of the redback songs and all that from the choir. But uh, I sat there and it got real still. And then the piano began to play, and it was almost like everybody knew what was going to happen, but me. <laughs> <laughs> And they got they got up and sang. When how does it start, Danielle? All hail the power. But it's the it's the more. Yeah. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. I mean, they, they they got into that, and it was parts, and it was flowing parts, and everything. And I was going. Oh. I just, you know, because uh, there'd be more than a hundred of them up. In the choir, and when they started into that, I said, "Wow, my my, they blessed my heart. They just blessed my. I believe they blessed God's heart. I do, I really do. And uh, they they meaningful. And to see those just children, you know, just junior age, younger, singing along with and singing with the same uh, vibrant spirit as their parents, determined." You know, that was a blessing. Amen. Amen. I'll, I'd rather hear all of that, wouldn't you? I'd rather hear all of that than what they're singing in a lot of churches today. Amen. Amen. Oh, all yeah. the CCM stuff and everything. Oh. I'm not going to go that way. Amen. Which will be an hour right there. Hmm. All right. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Brother Mike Thurman, would you ask the Lord to touch us and touch this? session this afternoon. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank God for the Word of God. Yes. We thank God for the salvation of God and such a great Savior you are. Yes. Lord, help us to learn those things that we need to make us all better servants of the Lord and help us to get our hearts truly set on fire for the cause of Christ and missions. And I pray, Lord, that you'd answer our questions and some of us don't even know what questions to ask. So you know what we need before we even ask. So we ask you to teach us thy ways, O oh Lord, and lead us in straight paths today. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Brother Paulman will come. And, uh, he's been a, been a blessing to our family, to our work. He was here last year and uh, helped us. Amen. Let me see. Yeah. You got glasses. Can I use that part? I am excited to be here. I've uh, been excited about this since last year. And so, had a wonderful time here last year and got a lot of help last year and so uh, looking forward to this. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation. Amen. I'm going to do something that uh, might be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to deal with the indigenous church more from a not a strictly precept type, but more of a principle, uh, the, the, the principle of the need of indigenous churches, independent churches. Um, you know, as we look down through here, and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to look, Revelation uh, chapter number 2, uh, and I'm actually going to look at the church of Pergamos. 
Um, you know, a lot of, um, in dealing with this uh, issue, dealing with this subject, there's a lot of, you know, probably the most uh, common way of identifying what we are and what we're supposed to be is through contrasts. And we identify that we are independent Baptist churches in contrast to denominational churches. Yep. We are not a denomination. Uh, as, as, as I am a Baptist, I'm, the Baptist is not a denomination. Right. Um, you know, it is, uh, you look in the history of the Baptist, and we've never been a denomination. Right. Uh, anytime Baptists have corrupted themselves and degraded into a denomination, they cease to be Baptist. And uh, again, in, in, in contrast, they become Protestants. How about that? You know, and, and um, you know, the, the, the same thing is you are either in uh, an indigenous church or you are what I've, uh, me and some several other people have labeled an empirical church. And, and by empirical, I mean you are either, you know, in, in, the, in the job of building a church or you're building an empire. Come on. And, um, you know, once you get into the empirical church movement, you, number one, have desecrated all the principles that uh, Brother Huffington yeah. so eloquently brought out and pointed out to us this morning and uh, so powerfully brought them out. Um, and, and so I'm not going to go over all of those specific points, but deal with it more as a, uh, the, the philosophy of it and the illustration of it as we deal with this church at Pergamos. And so let me, let me read a few verses here, Revelation chapter number 2, and I'm going to start uh, in verse number 12. And uh, the Bible says here to the angel of the church at Pergamos, write these things, saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nic Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Our Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day that you've given us, and Lord, the, uh, the privilege of being able to gather together here, and Lord, being able to look at your word, and uh, Father, receive instruction, receive uh, encouragement, uh, Father, just receive a challenge, and uh, Father, Lord, I do pray that you would help us uh, again, help us to, uh, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Yes. Father, Lord, I do pray that you would fill me with your spirit, God, I pray that you would anoint me for the task at hand of preaching your word, yes. and God, I do pray that you would give the people that are gathered here, ears to hear, and Lord, a heart to receive your word. And, and God, we do just pray that you would be glorified, that you would be honored in everything that's said and everything that's done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, a little bit about this church at Pergamos as we get into this. I, uh, the, the name Pergamos, it, it means much marriage. And, and Pergamos is the married church. This is the church that married the state. Um, the, the thing that we've got to understand is 
You know, the church is to be married only to the Savior. Amen. I mean, that's it. Anytime the church marries someone or something else, you've, you've got sin, you've got degradation, uh, you know, you've got corruption. And uh, this is the church that, that married into the state. Now, whether the nature of the marriage is political or denominational, the effect is the same. The danger is the same. And, you know, again, you, you look here in this passage, Revelation 2, Revelation 3, as, as, um, as you go through here, you'll, you'll see the prophetic layout of the church age. Um, here you have... Uh, again, the, the, the church at Pergamos, historically, um, this is the church under Constantine. Um, this follows right upon the heels of Smyrna, which, of course, uh, Smyrna was the persecuted church. Uh, again, let me lay a few things out historically before we really get into the meat of this, but um, historically... That uh, church at Smyrna under Nero was the persecuted church. And, and the church was enduring much persecutions. Um, and I'm not going to get into a whole lot of the, the details of that. But uh, th again, the, the, the goal of Nero was the destruction of the church. I mean, that, that's, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to destroy the church. He wanted to destroy Christianity. He wanted to destroy the Bible. He hated God, tried to set himself up as God, set himself up over the church. And, uh, and, and if we're not going to bow down at the feet of Nero, he, you know, martyrdom was, is going to follow. Um, the problem was you get to the end of Nero's life, all that persecution did was it resulted in the purification of the faith of that early church. Right. Their faith, instead of being extinguished, their faith shone brighter. And, and, and so Nero, who, whose goal was the destruction of the church, ended up strengthening the church. Then all of a sudden, Constantine comes along. Make no mistake about it, the goal of Constantine was the same goal as Nero. It was the destruction of the church. The only thing was, Constantine looked at what Nero did, saw how ineffectual it was, and he thought, I've got to do something. If I'm going to destroy the church, I've got to do it a different way. And so instead of persecuting the church, instead of unleashing the sword upon the church, what Constantine did was he opened his arms and he said, I want to welcome you into our society. I want you to become one of us. But in order for you to do that, you're going to have to drop a few things and you're going to have to embrace tolerance. And I mean, um, this, this, and the whole thing about it, this is where we're at today. I mean, I mean, the cry against the church right now in our society is tolerance. That's right. That's right. You, listen, you, you, you cannot be fanatical. You cannot just, you listen, that, that Bible, it's an ancient book, and we respect that book, but you've got to be tolerant about how you react with other people and with the things that you call sin Listen, that's just that's just sections of society, and so you've got to be tolerant about that. Oh, come on. I mean, it's Pergamus all over again. That's right. The, the, the problem was where Nero failed through the flame and the sword, Constantine actually succeeded through tolerance and through welcoming them in and through allowing them to become part of that society yes. and uh, part of that organization. And so, but again, make no mistake about it, Constantine's objective was the destruction of the church. And now all of a sudden you have this, 
again, this is the rise of the papacy. Um, we're, 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 we're going through a call for unity, for tolerance. Um, and so now, all of a sudden, the church, and again, you've you got to understand, they've just come through centuries of persecution. Uh, Matthew, the book of Matthew, it talks about wearing out the saints of the Most High God. Yeah. The saints have been wearied because of persecution. So now, all of a sudden, Constantine comes and says, listen, don't wear yourself anymore. Don't wear yourselves out anymore. Just become one of us. Let, let's embrace. Let's, let's be tolerant one of another. Let's, uh, uh, let, let's join one another. And because of the wearing out of the saints, they, they became, um, could you call them victims? Or uh, they, they, they became, there, there was a weakness there. In that moment of weakness and the weariness, they embraced that call for tolerance. They embraced that call for unity. Uh, and, I, and I want to make a statement right here. Um, and uh, we need to understand that unity at the cost of the truth is treason. Right. That's right. Unity at the cost of the truth is treason. It's treasonous towards our Savior. It's treasonous towards the Scriptures. It's treasonous towards the saints of God who laid down their lives for the truth of this book. It's treason. And, and you say that's harsh language. Yes, it is. But uh, I use harsh language on purpose because the call for tolerance is so great and so perpetual and so unending that that call is wearing people down. And I, wanna, I want you to understand that when we compromise on these things, when we unify with these things, Listen, it is nothing short of treasonous right. towards our Savior. Truth. And so you say, well, it's, it's just a minor little thing. No, it's not a minor thing. That's right. and, and I'm going to go in and I'm going to show you some of these things about how important this is. Um, but I want you to notice that I'm going to deal um, today and tomorrow with uh, the, the, these two things. Uh, uh, verse 14, verse 15, and there's twins in Pergamos. Uh, and we're going to deal with these twins, twin doctrines of Pergamos. And uh, the first one is the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, and that's what we're going to deal with today is this doctrine of Balaam. And that, that doctrine of Balaam is exactly what, what, what uh, Constantine was engaged in. Um, and that is the doctrine of corruption or the doctrine of compromise. And, and, and we're, we're going to allow this compromise to come in, uh, again, for unity's sake, for going along's sake. And uh, again, as I, as I mentioned, whether it's political or denominational, the danger's the same. Yeah. Right. The entrapment is the same. And so looking, looking at this doctrine of Balaam, uh, uh, of course, you know, you go back. Uh, the doctrine of Balaam is found in Numbers chapter 22 through Numbers 25. Uh, for the most part, um, there's things in the Bible that are written in a few other places. Um, but again, you go back to Numbers chapter 22, and we'll probably get back there eventually. But, you know, the, you, you look at this doctrine of Balaam, you look at the history of Balaam. Uh, the New Testament talks about Balaam, and it still calls him a prophet. Balaam was a prophet, all right, um, and, and, and again, all of a sudden, you, you come out and Balak, that, that king, and uh, who was uh, Balak king of? Moab. He was the king of Moab. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll get into Moab a little bit as we go into this, but all of a sudden, that king of Moab comes to the prophet, and he said, there's a people come out of Egypt, and what you say I want you to do? I want you to curse them. That, that's the whole thing, Balak's intention. Again, we, we go right back to Nero, right back to Constantine. What's the intention? The intention.
Pension is the destruction of the church. The intention is the destruction of God's people. Um, and, and, and listen, just, just like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying not to, you know, pile upon what Brother Heffington said this morning. But uh, listen, when, when you're dealing with these things of, of exporting not the gospel to the foreign countries, but exporting a religious form of the American welfare system, right. you are robbing those people of that natural spiritual growth right. that God intends for them. Right. You, you've taken right. that away. Right. I mean, how are they to grow in the grace of giving if, if we give everything to them? Right. Right. That's right. You say, well, what, what's, what's the intention? Listen, you go back and, and deal with it from a spiritual nature, the intention is the devil wants that whole movement to succeed because it so hinders the growth. And, and, uh, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a word that probably a lot of people, when I say that, you're, you're going to cringe, okay? But I'm going to use this in its proper, definite form, and that is you are retarding the growth of God's people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You are hindering the growth of God's people. Right. Why? Because you're not allowing that natural form that God had intended in their life. And, and, and dare I say it, one of the ironies of it is you uh, experience that growth in your own Christian life. And now all of a sudden you've embraced in that empirical missions movement and, and the experience that you received through God's relationship with you, you're preventing from other people over there. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Listen, the intention is the destruction of God's people. The, the last thing the devil wants is for there to be a strong, native, indigenous, national church anywhere. Anywhere. Um... You know, and again, you know, one one of the things with with with, with our ministry that I deal with, I you know, I mean, we, we print Bibles in all these different languages, but one of the things that I do is I go around and I help a lot of these church planters uh, around our own country, and we're dealing with the same thing with them. Is yeah. is you know, you, you've got people either either out west, out in Utah, um, that instead of developing people from Utah from that place of salvation to dedication to consecration to surrender and service what you're instantly doing is you're going back uh, back to Georgia back to North Carolina and saying we need more preachers out here in Utah well grow them out there that's right that's what you're to do that's right. we are, you're not to import them constantly you are to go out there and you're going to start that church, develop that church, grow that church, grow those people, quit relying on the importation of, of preachers back from that home country. Right. Listen, the, the, the destruction of God's people. You know, um, again, again, the cause of this. Say, what, what, what's the cause of it? 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 15, Balaam, the son of Bezor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean that that's again, we're talking about the doctrine of Balaam. Well, what was the allurement? What was the enticement that Balak gave to Balaam? He said his his um, the, the root cause or, or the, the, the root desire was the destruction of God's people. And he says, if you will curse me, them people, I'm going to write you a love offering check like you've never seen before. Yeah. That's it. He said, I, I'm going to give you, I, I'll, I'll give you a room filled with treasure. I'm going to increase uh, your wealth. I'm, and and that's, it's all about that. Yeah. Um, Jude, verse number 11, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. Wow. 
We're talking about the doctrine of Balaam here as it, uh, as it uh, applies to the indigenous church. And, and uh, I, I know this has already been mentioned one or two times earlier about, you know, the, the whole writing of those prayer letters. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's like, you know, we're, we're going to do this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contrive this so that I can write this exciting letter so that I can generate all this all this revenue, all this money, and all of a sudden the concern and the care is no longer about the spiritual welfare of those people, but about the health of my bank account. Mm. That, that, that's the motive for it all. I mean, that, that was the motive back in numbers. That's the motive uh, that, that we're dealing with today. It's filthy lucre Yeah. Wow. Hmm. You know, I um preach it on, bro. Yeah, I preach. I several years ago I made a statement for the Pat and I, and I were talking and I told them, I said, you know, th this thing has gotten so bad. I mean the lies, the deception, the contriving of everything. I said you know, it, it's gotten so that I can't even enjoy a good missionary presentation anymore. Oh, you know, I mean, I, I remember there was one guy uh, came to our church, made this presentation. Him and his pastor spent six weeks in the Philippines. And uh, I can't remember the, the raw number that he gave, but he said that they led so many people, so many thousands of people to the Lord in six weeks. And, you know, of course, one of the curse of, smartphones and everything is I, I'm sitting there in church and so I googled the population of the Philippines and I divided it by how many people that they supposedly led to the Lord in six weeks and I came to figure out that it would take them three and a half years to convert all of the Philippine islands to the Lord and so I said man we ought to save a ton of missions money and uh, bring everyone else home and just send him and his pastor there for the next three and a half years You're exactly right <laughs> you know uh, say, what? what is that? Filthy lucre. I mean, he's trying to, to contrive and write this exciting stuff. It's all lies. For what? For filthy lucre's sake. That's where we're at. Matter of fact, I, let, let's go back to Numbers chapter 22. Um, I, I, want, I want you to notice uh, a few things about this. Numbers chapter 22 and in verse number 8, we're, we're, we're talking about, we're talking about Balaam here. And uh, in Numbers chapter 22 and in verse number 8, he said unto them, Lodge here this night and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me. And the princes, uh, princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And, and, and so he, he I want you to notice that his words, his words sounded eloquent. His words sounded good. His words sounded correct because he says here, he says, lodge here this night and I'll bring you word again as the Lord shall speak unto me. So what's the problem? The Lord already spoke. Yeah. You know, the Lord already told them what to do. He didn't like that answer. So he said, well, you just wait here one more night. We'll see if God changes his mind in the morning. Listen, God is not going to change his mind about how the work of God is going to be done. Amen. Turn over to um, Numbers chapter 31. You're in Numbers 22. Go over to Numbers 30, 31. Numbers chapter 31 and... Verse number 15. Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. He, he, we go from his words being correct to now his his counsel was corrupt. I mean, he, he said the right words at the beginning, made it sound spiritual, made it sound proper, made it sound correct. But then, 
because of the the compromise and everything that, that's going on, um, you know, he, he ended up giving them counsel. And, and, and the real tragedy of this, the whole thing with, uh, with this doctrine of Balaam was that when they could not convince Balaam or convince God to curse the people, through their counsel, through their instruction, they got the people themselves to sin such an egregious sin that God had to judge them himself. Right. And so where, where God would not curse them at the beginning, God had to curse them at the end because of the sin that they got, that, that they got involved with. Um, we, you look at the, the corruption, you look at the cause, you look at this case. Well, again, going back to, um, to Revelation chapter 2, where it talks about this doctrine of Balaam. And, and it tells us, what is, what is the doctrine of Balaam? Verse 14 of Revelation 2, who, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. That right there is, I mean, it, 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 it really, it breaks it down. The whole thing with, with the fact of limiting, you know, uh, exporting American religious welfare Again, what you're doing is all of those people over there, you're casting a stumbling block in front of them. That's exactly right. As I, as I said, you are retarding their growth. You are limiting their growth. You are hindering their spiritual growth. You know, God, is, God has got a, a design and got a plan for, for each of us going, going from, from salvation uh, to submission, to service, to sanctification. Again, all that, all that development of our Christian life that, that each and every one of us here, we've all experienced it. And God has put different things in our path to help us to go through those trials, to grow us, to nurture us, to develop us. But yet what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cause a stumbling block before you uh, and I'm not going to allow you to grow I'm not gonna. I'm gonna actually hinder God from working in your life of growing you the way He did me. I mean, that that's what an egregious thing that He's done, casting a stumbling block. Um, again, Numbers chapter twenty-three and twenty-four. There's uh, as as the the compromise has gone on there with that doctrine of Balaam. There was three different moves. I mean, he, you know, he said, uh, you know, curse me this people. And all of a sudden, Balaam, what's he gone back with? He comes and blesses Israel. And he says, let's move. Try a different mountaintop. And he does, he does that, moves three times. And there's three attempts at the cursing, you know. Um, and so you, you, you'll see here the, this stumbling block. Um. Let me do this. Turn over to 1 Kings 13, because I want you to see this. Where, where, does, where does this stumbling block come from? You, you do realize that the danger that we're facing in biblical missions and a biblical missions movement, the biggest danger is not from the government. No. It's not from the drunkards. No. Nope. I mean, it's, it, 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 it's not from the, it, it's not from, listen, we send a lot of Bibles down into Mexico. Our biggest enemy is not the cartel. All right? So who was it? The biggest danger to the, that, that caused that stumbling block to the children of Israel was someone who the New Testament calls a prophet. You get over, in a, and I don't remember where it is over in Jeremiah, but uh, God said, I'm against the prophets, everyone that stealeth my words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. First Kings chapter 13, 
We have, uh, in verse number one, Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord. And, and you have here this prophet, this, the Bible says in verse number one, it was a man of God. This man of God came out, uh, out of Judah. And, and he was given an assignment by God. You're to go up and you're to cry against this altar. And he does this by the word of the Lord. And, and, and of course, you know, you, you, you get into all the events of this that happened. But at the end of this, you go to verse number seven. The man of God does what he's told to do. He goes up there and he cries against the altar, cries against this religious system. He cries the word of the Lord. Verse 7, the king of that land comes out. And the king said to the man of God, come home with me, refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, remember this is the king, if thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place for so it was charged me by the word of the Lord saying eat no bread nor drink water nor turn again by the same way that thou camest so he went another way and returned not by the way that he came to Bethel he does what God tells him to do he, he follows the instructions of God as, as he says I was charged by the word of the Lord how to do this what to do the path to take, all of a sudden the king comes to him and, and, and no matter what this king says, no matter what this king does, he is not going to convince the man of God to compromise one bit. That man of God is determined, I'm doing the will of God, I'm going to do it right, I'm going to do it proper, I'm going to do it as God said. Matter of fact, the word he used, he says, it was charged to me. I mean, that, that's a very vehement term. That's a, that's a militant term. That's an unyielding term. Not going to compromise. Right. You get to verse number 11. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. All of a sudden his sons come and he tells the old prophet that's in Bethel about what the man of God had done. And um, all of a sudden, the old prophet tells his son, saddle me the ass, verse 13, verse 14, he went after him, found him sitting under an oak, and he said unto him, art thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. And I want you to notice, the old prophet said the exact same thing the king said. But all of a sudden now, because the the, the enticement is not from the king, but the enticement comes dressed in a religious garment. All of a sudden now, the man of God responds to him, and uh, he says, verse 16, he says, I may not return with thee or go with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place, for it was said to me. The first thing he did was he softened in his terms. He told the king was charged me. Yes. Unyielding. Not even up for discussion. The old prophet comes and he says, it was said to me by the word of the Lord. Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water nor turn again uh, to go by the way that thou camest. Verse 18, he said, I am a prophet as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. Uh, but he lied, but he lied unto him. Verse 19, what happened? The Bible says that the man of God went back with him. That man of God was unyielding when it came to that king. That king could not do anything to convince that man of God to compromise.
But that lying old prophet, that person dressed in religious garments, yeah. he came and he said, again, right back at the beginning, what are we talking about? The doctrine of Balaam is tolerance. It's all, come on, man of God. You know, we're, we're not talking, you know, you joined us in our idolatry. Man of God, I, I'm, I'm telling you, man of God, just come drink water. Man of God, just come and eat bread at my house. Just just take a little bit of, I'm not asking you, man of God, to move up here. What I'm asking you, man of God, is would you just come and just, just relax at my house for a day? The, 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 the call of the yielding of this is not a drastic change. It's not a drastic maneuver. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter number 1, when it talks about the, the uh, compromise away from pure doctrine, it says that, that it wasn't a change, it wasn't a turn, it was a swerve. Um, up in Michigan... You know, our roads, all of our roads have potholes. And, and in order to avoid those potholes, we are constantly swerving. Say, what's a swerve? We, we turn that steering wheel just a little bit. And then we turn it back the other way. I mean, it's, you know, that's what we do. We're constantly altering our path minutely. And that's what, he, that's what he's calling for. And, and, and when the king could not convince the man of God to do it, that old prophet dressed in religious garments, that man who lied, that one who compromised already in his life, calling for tolerance. Okay, come on, man. It's not that big of a deal. I mean, you know, we, we, we can just, you know, we can embrace this empirical missions. I mean, you, you, you can let me, you, you know, you can let me have my filthy lucre. You don't have to call me out on that. Listen, that, that, that's, You go back here to Revelation 2, yeah, yeah. back to Pergamos here. There's a, the casting of a stumbling block. We're going we're gonna to get really deep into this now. Because as he says there, he says in verse 14, who taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And, and listen, if you think that's bad, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. Mm. There was a physical fornication going on there. This doctrine of Balaam as it applies to the church, we're talking about a spiritual fornication. Mm. Listen, God, God hates spiritual fornication. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and again, as with Balak, if they could not destroy God's people, talking about that church at Pergamos, they would induce God's people to sin so that God would destroy them. And, and, and listen, this, this whole thing of committing fornication, you know, again, we're, we're, we're going right back to, to that beginning of we're, we're taking these people we're, we're bringing them from a place of salvation to the development of their Christian life. And now in them, instead of them being trained and looking to the hand of God for their sufficiency, yes. now they are looking to the hand of that American missionary for their sufficiency. Think about it. They're looking to the hand of, of uh, that American dollar to their sufficiency. Yeah. And, and, and again, all of a sudden, everything that, again, I, I go back there, and I, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but everything that we have been through, the development of our lives, you know, you, you remember back when you first got saved, and, and all of a sudden, you know, you, 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 know you, you, you got confronted with baptism, and you submitted to that, and the next thing was, all of a sudden, someone mentioned to you tithing, and all of a sudden, you know, that thing scared you to death. What do you mean? I got I got to give ten percent of of everything. That I, I, there's no way I can survive on that. And 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 that that those first early days and weeks and months 
of, of tithing as a young Christian, it was there's a fearfulness, but all of a sudden there was an excitement because God met your need. Amen. And you saw that, hey, listen, God is not just a God of an ancient book. He's a God that's living today, and he loves me today, and he cares about me today. Amen. And through that fornication, we've robbed that of them people. We've stolen that away from them. Listen, there was... Um, you can look back, Leviticus chapter number 10 dealing with the strange fire, um, you know, and the judgment of God. Um, but one thing, uh, uh, let me finish up here because I, I want you to notice something here. Um, several things uh, as, we, as we finish up here. Again, Numbers chapter 22, Numbers chapter 23, you have the doctrine of Balaam. Say, who was that all brought by? It was that that was all brought up from the people of Moab. What, one of the problems that we have is unless we deal with this, unless we confront all of this, this whole doctrine, or this whole people, this whole corruption is going to continue. You, you get to Nehemiah when the, the people are coming back into the city, coming back to the country. Nehemiah chapter 13. In verse number 23, uh, the Bible says, In those days also saw I Jews that had married the wives of Ashdod and of Ammon and of Moab. I mean, this whole thing of the corruption of Moab was not an isolated event. It didn't just deal with Balaam and it didn't just deal with the children of Israel um, in the book of Numbers. You get all the way back, generations of the past, all of a sudden you have, you're, you're, you're dealing with, uh, with Nehemiah and, and he's dealing with the same thing. The Moabites are at it again. They're corrupting God's people. And listen, that corruption continues. That corruption is passed on generationally. It is passed on continually. Um, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse number 10. Who was um, one of the biggest obstacles to Nehemiah the whole time that he's doing his work? It was a man by the name of Sanballat. And in Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse number 10, you'll find out that Sanballat was from the city of Moab. Wow. Yeah. That Moabite, I mean, that's what they're at. That they, they will not stop. They will not let loose. They're, they're just going to keep... We're going to corrupt you, and we're going to corrupt you um, under Balaam. We're going to corrupt you under Nehemiah. We're going to corrupt, we're going to corrupt, we're going to corrupt. We're just, we're not going to stop. You, you look here, historically, again, going back here to Pergamos. You know, the church here joined with the state. Christians during that time, they received privileges and they received rights and they received all these different things that, 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 um, that Constantine promised them. But they lost their testimony and they lost their Bible for a thousand years. And I mean, that's not hyperbole or anything. I mean, that that's for thousands thousand years they suffered under the hands of the papacy and they lost their bible they lost their testimony they lost their influence listen this is a stumbling block you say is it that big of a deal listen here, here's the bad thing about it uh, i'm going to mention this and i'm done it is verse 14 numbers uh revelation chapter 2 verse number 14 where we deal with the doctrine of balaam the doctrine of Balaam is a doctrine of compromise. And it leads directly into verse 15. And the very next thing that that church deals with is the doctrine of the, uh, those Nicolaitans. And listen, that one 
leads into another. They start off with the doctrine of compromise. What is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? It's a doctrine of control. Yes. yes it is. It's a doctrine of tyranny. And where we are to be set free, all of a sudden we are no longer free. We are under the hand of a tyrant. Listen, then, you know, the famous saying, if, if we won't be ruled by God, or if we won't be governed by God, we'll be ruled by tyrants. Listen, that's true politically, but that's true spiritually. Listen, that, that doctrine of Balaam. Brother Pat and I, Thank you. That's good. Amen. Excellent. Amen. I was, uh, I had a lot of things going on in my mind while he was preaching. And I hate to say this, but it, a lot of it took my mind back to, um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to cite examples. I don't want it to go this direction, but I, a lot of examples of, uh, corruption and compromise that we've seen over the years on the mission field. And we've seen seen the reality of it. Yeah. And it's uh, some of it's been among people that we identify as an independent Baptist. And a lot of it is a lot of it uh, starts as a a true desire. Mhm. Mm it's hard to it's so it's hard to, to call it out because even when even when an individual is seen his or is is involved or he's seen his ministry corrupted, he's he may still have a true desire and doesn't fully realize what is what is taking place. And there's, as we've said, we said it yesterday here to our folks, and we said it, uh, we, I think it's been said today in one way or the other, that God didn't call us to be policemen and travel around the world to fix all these things. Right, right. But what we want to do is, is be positive enough with young missionaries on how, how we do this without sliding into the money traps and without what we do on the field becoming merely an extension of an American thing where we have to keep coming back. You know, if we build a building on the field, we have to maintain that building. No, so if you, in the first term or two, if we were to raise enough money to build two or three buildings, aren't we thinking ahead? I mean, if we, we have ever owned a home or had to care for a home or this place, we don't know any money here, but I want to tell you, it, and my children will tell you, my wife will tell you, our church member will tell you, they, they, just, to, just to try to, we have a small number of people and we have more facility <laughs> It confuses some people that come around. How is it they have this facility and it's a small, and we don't owe any money? Well, the Lord, the Lord did that. We have the facility. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, if if I could let you into my mind sometimes on the on on what grieves me as far as just keeping it maintained. Yeah. Right. Don't ask my son-in-law because David knows. It, he, know, he knows the, the stress sometimes and we've had some real problems just trying to keep a building maintained so if you go if you raise all that extra money and take it to the mission field oh, yeah. and build a building and as what brother Pullman said about um, 
robbing them. Well, let's go, let's go more basic th than that. Who's going to take care of that? It's, who's going to take care of that building? And Brother Heffington said that he's seen, and now don't get, don't clam up on me. Oh. I'm not, I'm not after anybody. But Brother Heffington said and told us that he saw a building, built one, at least one, on the field that was built with American money, not, not the Nationals building it, and they sold it. <laughs> See? So somewhere along the line, you got to come back. If you're going to build a building, you got to come back to the same source and raise more money to put the new roof on it after the storm. You got to you got to come back and raise more money to take care of the foundation that got washed away after the flood. You, under, you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So when does it become? The responsibility of the national people to take care of their own building. If you teach them from the beginning, yeah. I think yeah. everything, yeah. Brother, if everything's yeah. been said today. If you teach them that that's their responsibility from the very beginning. Yeah. So I was thinking about this when, and I don't want to get into a mess of my own. I want Brother McGuffey to come, but I, I couldn't help but really, really ponder again these things of. Of, can, do we trust God right. when we, we go to the field, mm. or do we? Are we instead making ourselves financiers, real estate agents, architects, and engineers on the field for what? So that we have something. I want to say it now. This is, where, this is where we have a problem because we want folks to think that, to, we want folks to believe in us. We want folks to say that something is happening with that man. Something is happening on the field there. And, and yet, even some missionaries are under, while they're, I guarantee you, while, while some of them are back raising more money to get the roof on that. They're under great, great pressure and stress. They're under great stress because they, they're, they're, they want to do right. They want to see people saved. They want to see people grow. But what, they, what we go to the field with is we think when we go to the field, that it has to look like there what it looks like here. And we put so we put ourselves under that. We're the ones that ruin our own health <laughs> with the pressure that what it gets taken, the pictures that get taken on the field have to look like something that Americans can recognize as a church. Because it's not enough. It doesn't seem enough to, to take pictures just of people. Eventually, especially if you've been there after a while and you're coming home on furlough and you're saying, what have I got to put in my presentation? Right. Okay. And so the, the pressure is on you. But is that your responsibility? Did did God really call me? I, I went through this years ago. Did God really call me to be a real estate agent on the field? Did, did God call me to be a builder? Did God call me to be a, an expert in sewer systems? Now, I guarantee you, that a lot of that came along anyway, even though we didn't pay for it. I mean, we worked with the nationals. When they were doing it themselves, we got in. We got in it with them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, it, and, just, and so we learned a lot anyway. And they they occasionally came around and said, "Huh, what's the best way to do this?" And, and I would say, "I have some construction experience, like Brother Heffington does, but I I usually just turn it around. I said, "No, teach me how to do it. How you do it here? Mm -hmm. How you do it here? Show me how to do it." <laughs> I mean, uh, 
How do you how do you put a how do you put a septic system in what they call lowest soil? You know what lowest soil is? Or L O I N? How do you put a septic system in it? Do you know the Filipinos can teach you how to do that? So when that I just that's all we did. That's all we did. I refused to become any of that. I refused to become any of that. So they built all of that they did themselves. <laughs> and of course the Chinese can't have a building anyway. We've already been through that. I mean they can't they can't own land, they can't own but the, a church can still be built. So I think we create expectations and we build pressures upon us. We put great loads on our own shoulders as missionaries to make it look there like Americans something Americans will recognize is when they see our pictures. And so we, we don't need to do that, brethren. We don't need to do that. Prayer letters even to, to, to this day are some, one of the hardest things I do. It, it's one of the hardest things I do because I have the sense that a lot of pastors simply will not understand what I'm doing. Yes. And so it's very, it's very difficult to write prayer letters, but I'm not going to lie in a prayer letter. And uh, I, uh, all the years we were on the field, I never put numbers. Amen. I talked about people being saved. I talked about people growing, but I never gave numbers. I never said so many souls were saved, so many this, so many that. I left numbers off. I, I, I refused to be under the pressure. And like here, like here, you know, you could say, ah, we led that one to the Lord. And six months later, they're off someplace and some, you know, the wild blue yonder. You can't chase them down with, with radar and three beagle dogs, right? Well, there's one number gone. Amen. <laughs> so I... <laughs> I'm, I'm ref I've always refused to play the numbers game. I don't play it now. I love souls. I want more people to be saved. I want a great number to be saved. I work to that end, but I'm not a captive to putting a number on a piece of paper. I'm just not. So... I think we create expectations often that we can't, in the end, really justify in doing. So I didn't want to preach. No, <laughs> hey. <laughs> but, you know, that doesn't mean you don't love souls. That's right. Amen. And you remember the missionaries that went to fields 100, 150 years ago that were on the field for 20 years before they ever saw someone come to Christ. They didn't lie about it. They just, they just told the truth and they preached the gospel. They told the truth to people at home. They preached the truth to people on the field. And it was not success, it was faithfulness that mattered. Amen. I mean, su success in man's eyes. It was not success in man's eyes that mattered. It was success in God's eyes that mattered. So, so we don't know. I, I, let, let me tell you about a young lady. I want to tell you, Brother, Brother McGuffey, you come up here so I don't go too long. <laughs> I've always remembered this, even when I went to China and I went to, went to the Philippines. I used to work for a company in Missouri. When I first got out of the service, I worked for a company that had an 18-year-old young lady. You've already got the microphone. Mm -hmm. Had an 18-year-old young lady. I was in my early 20s at that time. Just got out of the Air Force and made minimum wage to be a planner, a, a, a 
a human, uh, I mean a manpower planning uh, <laughs> expert. They paid me minimum wage. <laughs> and I'd walk into this warehouse, to the, the offices were in the center of a big warehouse, and I'd walk in there and there was an 18-year-old young lady who had had a lot of problems. She had a, she had a child. She didn't have a husband. She sat in, the, in that office as a secretary. And I was always putting tracks on her desk and talking to her and asking her to read tracks. And I, I, uh, every day, every day I gave her something. And she'd get so angry at me. She got so angry at me. I don't want tracks. I don't want to hear your, uh, I don't want to hear your message. Leave me alone. And uh, she got she got upset enough to where she went to the to the boss, and the boss called me in, and he said, "Why are you aggravating her?" I said, "I don't think I'm aggravating her, but I want her to know the truth of the gospel, and I'm giving her gospel literature. If you tell me to stop, I'll stop." He said, "I'm not going to tell you to stop." <laughs> So I, I tried to be kind and sweet and not, you know, not rile her up too much, but I continued to give her literature. So we, we went on to Texas from there. We went back to Florida from there. I passed her 10 years later. 10 years later, we're getting ready to go to China. We're on deputation. We're in California waiting for visas. And I get a call from a church in Kansas City, and, and the pastor says, well, can you come back to our missions conference? We know you're waiting and you're about ready to go, but can you come? If we fly you back to Kansas City, will you come back to our conference? I said, sure. So I did. He had a read. The pastor had a reason and was willing to spend the money. For this, for one simple thing. Amen. I flew back to Kansas City, and that pastor uh, entered a church of 2,000 in Sunday school. At that time, it's not now. And that pastor said, I want you to take a ride with me tomorrow afternoon. I want you to take a ride with me. Go visiting with me. I said, well, this is a little unusual, I think. Big conference going on, a lot of things happening. And he chooses me to go visit with him. And we went out to Blue Springs, Missouri. And we went to a specific house. And we went out and knocked on the door. And the pastor opened the door. I mean, the man that was there opened the door. And uh, we walked in and sat down. And I looked over. There, there was children there, and there was this brother and sister. They were members of his church. And I kept looking over there, and um, mm -hmm. I said, how to know that, how to know that lady? And it went on, and we drank coffee. We talked about everything under the sun, and the pastor was sitting there with a big smile on his face the whole time. And we're sitting there, and she's smiling, and her husband's smiling, and I'm sitting there. I'm being played here. Yep. <laughs> Something's going on. Finally, that woman said, you, you don't know who I am. And I said, I ought to know you. She said, she gave me her maiden name. She says, I was a secretary at the warehouse out in Quarter, Missouri. And you came in and put tracks on my desk every day. And you told me about Jesus Christ. And I hated you. I hated the ground you walked on. And I wanted you to be gone. And I tried to get you fired. And the boss wouldn't fire you. And you were gone, you went off to Texas. And she said, I wanted some way to tell you that I never threw those tracks away. She'd, mm -hmm. she, she'd stick them in the hip pocket of her blue jeans. And she'd go home, take them, and read them. 
every time she got one. And she came to Christ and saved by the grace of God. And when they joined, she got married, and they joined, uh, what's the church in Blue Spring? Huh? Tri-City. Tri-City Baptist Church in Blue Spring. And she told, when, when she gave her testimony to the people, to the workers, she told them that whole story. And that personal worker at the altar said, I want you to tell that to the pastor. Because they were already supporting us. Wow. So that's why the pastor flew me from California to Missouri. So that woman could tell me how she got saved. Amen. Amen. And I want to tell you, when I went to the mission field, I didn't, I didn't really care about the numbers. I wanted the tracks out. I wanted the gospel out. I wanted the message out. Amen. And that's the way I am today. That's the way we act here. And I don't create unbiblical expectations. I ask God not to let me create expectations that are not biblical. Do what you're called to do. Do what you're called to do. And don't you don't have to build a resume of things that you're not called. Preach the truth. But I'm good. Yeah, right there. Amen. Amen. My name's Sonny McGuffey, if you don't know me. Uh, appreciate the invitation to be here for this conference. I think I'm the last one on the, uh, the, the program for the two sessions so far. If you think that he saved me till last because I'm a big shot keynote preacher, you are sadly mistaken. And I appreciate just the opportunity to be here. So thank you very much, preacher. Amen. Uh, real quick before, before I get into what I want to talk, we got a little table set up over there. There's little uh, booklets that I've got. Nothing costs a dime. I, uh, the Lord provides money. We get these things printed. There's a little thing on our mission agency. If you know somebody that's called God to be a mission field, this is a little pamphlet that was my deputation sermon that I preached in 65 different churches when I was on deputation in, in uh, 2016. Uh, the sword of the Lord princess for me. Amen. Amen. That don't make me anything special. This is a booklet. It's not mine. It's Brother Curtis Gibson's. And I noticed he didn't say anything about it. There's a stack of them on the table here. This changed my life. And uh, I, I, you ought to get that. It's about the indigenous principle. And that's why we're here this week. And I've got a card over there. It's my, our, my current uh, prayer card. I'd like you to have it. Please, I'll be able to take one home. And there's something else over there. My wife makes these rags. I mean, she does a lot of sewing, and every lady, or if you don't have your wife here, you have a wife that's a lady, uh, you are to get one of my wife's rags, or get the ire of my wife against you, amen? <laughs> but no kidding, if you don't get you one today, we'll make my wife pass them out tomorrow, they ain't going home with us, okay? Uh, I'm from Vicksburg, Mississippi, I was born and raised there. Uh, I was raised 65 miles north of Natchez, Mississippi. There was something down there at the time that was called uh, Maranatha Baptist Missions Incorporated. Dr. James Crumpton has already been mentioned by two or three different speakers. Uh, Dr. James Crumpton was very, very special to me. And I'll explain real quick, and then I'll say what I'm here to say. Uh, I, got, I surrendered to preach out of a church in Vicksburg that no longer exists. And what happened was is uh, God called me to preach, and I went as a novice, untrained, uh, down to Natchez, Mississippi, across the town and in the county part of, uh, of uh, uh, Adams County, Mississippi, uh, to take a church that had been left. A uh, uh, young man uh, at that time left it. He's now, I, I think, pastoring in Tennessee. But uh, the pulpit was vacant. People from uh, Brother Crumpton's church was filling that pulpit at the time. And one of them called me on the phone and said, 
would you be interested in taking the pulpit? I was up in Vicksburg at the time I did. I went down there and preached for them on a Wednesday night after I got off work from the Grand Gulf nuclear plant where I worked for 13 years as a nuclear refueling engineer after I graduated from an uh, from, uh, engineering program at Missouri State University. And uh, I just let you know that that church voted me in and I took it. I was a novice. I shouldn't have been preaching. I don't believe in novice preachers. But uh, uh, Brother Crumpton heard that there was a young man that's took, taken the, the uh, Maranatha, no, what was it called? Lighthouse Baptist Church and across town there. And uh, he told Brother Jenkins, he said, Brother Jenkins, I want you to take me out there to meet that preacher. And uh, when Brother, Brother uh, Crumpton met me, he did something like this. <laughs> I've seen that before. He knew that I was a novice and uh, felt sorry for me. And he must have had this thought in his head. He said, I'm going to help this boy. He needs yeah. help. Mm -hmm. Amen. He took me under his wing, and for six years I was there. And he and Brother Mel Rudder, uh, you know him. If you ever been to the old Kentucky uh, camp meeting, there's a plaque on the wall behind the pulpit up here. It's some kind of a dedication to Brother Mel Rudder. My, I was ordained by Brother James Crumpton, Westside Baptist Church. And Mel Rudder preached my charge. Amen. And Brother uh, uh, Robert Jenkins was like a big brother to me. Amen. It's where I learned the indigenous principle stuff was from them. I was not a missionary, didn't know I was ever going to be a missionary, but God put a missionary spirit in my heart. I wanted to be a missionary. My wife and I prayed for years when our children were still real young to go to the mission field. And every time we prayed, God said, no. Can we go? No. I thought you needed more missionaries. Yep, but no. You can't go. Amen. I, I didn't understand why. Uh, years after I was uh, through pastoring there in Natchez, God sent us to the uh, Grand Gulf, Rio Grande Valley, uh, where I pastored a church down there for seven years, and uh, real close to the mission field. My church was nine miles from the river. Amen. Mm -hmm. And when the wind was blowing just right, uh, you could smell the Matamoros dump. Amen. Uh, and we were there seven years, and I thought, this is my mission field. This is close. The Lord's going to let me get to the mission field. I loved it down there. I loved the people. I loved the food. And, and, and I loved the proximity to Mexico. I preached every month, at least once in Mexico. I've probably been uh, in Mexico over 100 times. And I just, but I thought as close as I was ever going to get. I still felt like I needed to go to the mission field somewhere. Even though we weren't there anymore, I had started a ministry taking young people to the mission field of Jamaica. I took almost 200 different young people, teenagers mostly, to the mission field of Jamaica. Uh, 15 teams in 13 years. Uh, uh, the largest team was 23, counting my wife and I, mostly teenagers, and me and my wife. And we went down, uh, we did it a lot of times. And then uh, God sent me to take a group of teenagers to Nigeria, West Africa. And I picked just me in because my wife couldn't go with me on that trip. There's no way we could afford the plane tickets for me and my wife both to go. So I couldn't take any girls if my wife ain't going. <coughs> so we took just me in. Brother Dustin, raise your hand. Or shake. He was one of them that went with me to Jamaica and to Nigeria. I'm glad you're here. Amen. I know you were going to be here. But uh, when I went to Nigeria, uh, it ruined the Jamaica ministry for me. I had never seen anything like it. He said he didn't, he didn't, he never claimed numbers. Well, we did. Amen. And it was a lot of hardship and grief to me that we did. But that first trip we reported that we saw over 7,000 saved that, that one week, two weeks really, uh, going on two weeks that we were over in Nigeria. And it blew me out of the water. Just blew me out of the water. And I worked for years uh, to start a ministry over there. Uh, I went in 2010, that's when we all went, and then went back in, no, 20, 2007, 2010 I went back, 11, 12, 13, didn't go to 2014 because of Ebola, and went back in 2015 and went back to live there in 2016, I mean, with my wife, my wife had never been there until we went in 2016. I surrendered in January of 2016 to be a missionary to Nigeria, turned our church in Monroe, Louisiana over to a younger man. And uh, we went over to Nigeria in July of that year. We raised our support in five months. I didn't say five years. I said right, right. five months. We went to the mission field. Amen. A little bit undersupported. And God took care of all of our needs. Amen. And uh, I'm just here to tell you, I, I said all that to say this.
Brother Crumpton said one thing, and he wasn't really talking to me, but I was always listening to him, and I overheard it, and he said one thing, he was talking to two of their missionaries, he said uh, uh, the most problem you're going to have on the mission field is with other missionaries. Yeah. Learned that the hard way. I had some problems with another missionary. And you know what it really was all about? Because I went over there with Maranatha training and that, and the uh, the indigenous principle was very, very important to me. And other missionaries are not trained that way. Right. And that was the difference. Amen. There was a battle that I tried to not engage. I don't I don't uh, I became one guy's enemy and he was never my enemy. Still ain't to this day. But uh, but it was all about the indigenous principle. The, the whole method was totally different than what we used. We believed and practiced the indigenous principle, and he's a kingdom builder. What can I say? I'm not going to tell you names. If you know who I'm talking about, I'd like you to not bring up their name either. But the idea there was is that um, they were doing things with the nationals that we as independent Baptists here would never permit, never can you imagine if you were past, some of you here are pastors of a church? Raise your hand if you pastor a church here in the United States. Okay, can you imagine if a, if one of the previous pastors, if you're not the founding pastor, comes to you and says, I'm, "I think I'm going to sell the building," you wouldn't put up with that, would you? How about a pastor across town that was telling you what you could and couldn't do, and things like that? We would never permit it there. But you know, things like that are. I was at one meeting. That uh, uh, I was, I was there. The other missionary was there. There was a national pastor there, and there was a guy who is now a national evangelist over there, sitting around a table discussing a church in that part of the country that was without a pastor. And the whole purpose of that meeting, I did not know it, was to assign a pastor to that independent Baptist church. And I was listening to that, and I said, uh, well, "Excuse me, fellas. Excuse me. I don't understand." Isn't it that independent Baptist church Amen. have the right under the will of God after prayerful consideration to choose and pick and, and to install their own pastor? Amen. We don't do it that way here is what I was told. Right. We don't do, uh, I wouldn't sit on a committee like that here, and I sure didn't want to sit on a committee like that. Look, but I said, but aren't we independent Baptists? Yeah, but it's different over here. Really? It's not supposed to be. That's Amen? Right. And right. there's a word that I'm going to use in just a minute to kind of explain all of it. But uh, but why are things so different? Well, there's reasons. And if I get another chance to speak, maybe I do tomorrow, I don't know. But if I do, I, I'm going to kind of pick up uh, where I left off, where I leave off today. And right now, I'm going to pick up where I left off last year. Amen? Take your Bible, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is what we're looking at. It's real easy to remember. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So listen to me. Remember the stuff on the table over there? I want you to get all of, one of all that stuff. Get everything. And get You ladies, get a, get a rag. <laughs> By the way, there's a preacher in, a, in a, a Mississippi that inspired my wife to make man rags, too. So there's some man rags over there. Uh, so get you one. But 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Amen. Are you there? Uh, just read the one verse, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Are you ready? It says, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's uh, on my prayer card. It was on our very first and original prayer card as missionaries. And something that I, I've always believed basically encapsulated the whole idea of the indigenous principle in this matter of of uh, that we're going to we I'll just say the word Amen duplicatable. Amen. If this is of God, if we're doing it scripturally, it's going to be duplicatable. Right. If it's not duplicatable, we're doing it wrong. Yeah, if it's not right. duplicatable, then we're not doing it God's way. The idea is that biblical Christianity will work anywhere oh, in yeah. this world. And it will work if we do it right. Amen. And what we got to do is learn the differences in what's right and what's wrong. And most American independent Baptists don't know. Yeah. It's not that they're wicked and they're, 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 they're you know, uh, and I'm getting more into it in a minute. But uh, it's an ignorance. 
It's not, it's not on purpose. Bless God, we're going to go over there and create kingdoms, and we're going to we're going to do it non indigenously and not duplicatable. We're going to send missionaries over there, and bless God, we're going to do it all wrong. That's not the problem. The problem is an ignorance. Amen. Right. I think, and this is where I was at coming to you from last year. We need a revival in the indigenous principle. Right. You know, I'm a, I'm, I'm now a uh, my, our, our church brought me home kind of off the mission field to take Brother Ellis' place. He was our mission agency uh, uh, director for eight or nine years. I thought it was nine. He said eight earlier. But whatever it was, amen. And he helped me a lot, amen. And uh, that, but, but, you know, I just tell you that uh, it, if it's, it, where was I going? I, my mind's going 10 different directions at the same time, amen. But, but uh, I came home to, 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 to basically be the director after his departure to Georgia uh, in our mission agency. And we are an indigenous principal mission board. Right. It's a local church mission board under the, our local church, really, not just verbiage. It's really under our local church. The mission board are men of our church. Amen. Amen. And you don't have to be a member of our church. You don't have to leave your church and join our church to be through our agency. Amen. You don't have to do that. But we, our agency is under the pastor. Now, I'm not the pastor of the church. He's the president of our agency. I'm just the executive director. I like that executive part. You know. <laughs> but I tell you that we are an indigenous principal uh, mission. And I will tell you this too. We're not judgmental about that. We know a lot of people do it wrong. Most of them it's just because they don't know any better. They've, they have not been taught or whatever. And it's not being taught anymore is the reason for that. But I, we're not judgmental. Our church now supports about 71 or 72 missionaries. And uh, we, uh, most of them are not real strong on indigenous principle. We don't blackball them if they don't dot their I and cross their T just like we do. We don't do that. But I wish they all knew. We've got a couple of missionaries that are really pretty egregious violators of the indigenous principle, a couple. Most of them, it's kind of nonchalant, but what we need is a revival of the indigenous principle with conviction. Amen. Right. The indigenous principle, folks that do believe in it just don't necessarily have a lot of conviction about it, right. okay? Uh, and I want, I want to be a part of the movement. When I... I'd never met Brother Bob before, Brother Pat and all. I never had. I started, I went, went, that something came in the mail. Uh, it was a white paper uh, through our uh, mission agency post office box. Miss Peggy got the mail, and she saw that in there, and she passed it on to me. I'm glad she did. And I remember thinking, this thing was about the indigenous principle. And I said, this guy believes in it. This guy, whoever he is, amen, this guy believes in indigenous principle with conviction. I want to meet this guy. I sent him a letter or something back, and just one thing led to two or three. And uh, when I found out he was having this conference, I called him and said, look, you know, I just want to come be a part of it. I'd like to get him to come down one day. We're going to start our missions uh, in, uh, institute, and he's going to be part of our teaching of missionaries. Uh, I am a mission board director, and it's very hard to uh, recruit missionaries this day and time. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, but listen, we're an indigenous principal mission board that nobody ever heard of. Okay, the one thing that we have going for us that we would hope that people that have a a, a, a conviction about the indi indigenous principle would want to seek out a mission board that is an independent. I mean, an indigenous principal mission board. Right. There's maybe five in the whole country, and only two that I know about. Ours and the one that Brother Heffington is part of. And I think the one over there too. Y'all's is local church missionaries only. Yeah. Uh, okay. No. no. Y'all take folks from outside too. I'm just here to tell you, there's not very many. And most young men or young women or couples that surrender to the mission field, they walk down the aisle of their church. They tell the pastor, God's called us. He counsels with them and does what good pastors do. And then they get to where they make a public prof profession of their calling to the mission field of Timbuktu. And there is a Timbuktu, by the way, you know. Right. But there is, a, but I'm going to tell you, uh, the pastor usually has some affiliation in the past with an already established mission board from way back yonder in yesteryear. And uh, he's going to automatically send his mission board, his, his missionary, to the mission board of 
of, that he's known about for 40 years, okay? But you know what? You need to check out mission boards because they've changed. That's right, man. Some of them have changed. Yeah. A lot of them are going through mission boards that a pastor knew about some of the changes may not do it. I would welcome you to check them out. Amen. Amen. Brother Ellis got his degree through Brother Stennett uh, at, uh, uh, you know, in Georgia. And uh, one of the things they made him do uh, is to do a project where he had to uh, do a survey of mission boards, you know. He surveyed several. I don't know how many, but uh, I, I wish he still had that paperwork. I'd like to have a copy. And, and there's certain little criteria. He was calling them and asking them about, oh, what do y'all feel about this subject? What do y'all feel about it? was probably the indigenous principle, I imagine. But anyway, when he, when he was finished that thing and turned it in as a project, he knew he was going to Maranatha Baptist Missions. Uh, yeah. Mission board down in Natchez, Mississippi. Yeah. Because one of the things was that indigenous principle. I mean, he knew it was to be biblical, and they had the conviction that he shared and they went through that board, amen? Uh, and I, I'm just here to tell you, it's hard to, it's hard to get them to come to your mission board. Uh, I've now been the mission board a director there for two years, and I haven't, I haven't recruited one yet successfully, amen? We've got some young people. We're waiting for them to grow up a little bit. We think we've got future, amen? But it, it, I'm just saying what we need, what our mission agency especially needs is there to become a revival in this indigenous principle? Right. I will drive all the way from west central Mississippi to Salem, Indiana, if it has any hope of helping to bring on this revival of the indigenous principle. I'll do it. I'll do it two or three or four, four times a year. It's a long trip. Come on, buddy. counting the hour time changes about eleven and a half hours for me. Amen. Yeah. And I'm getting older, and it's harder. And on. anyway. And I, I can't afford to fly the airplane and all that stuff. But anyway, but uh, in, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, there is, I count at least four generations there. Mm -hmm. You see, he said, uh, Paul did, he said, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Right. He said, see, Paul is saying there that uh, uh, the same uh, commit thou to faith in me. He says, Timothy, uh, what I was taught, I have taught you. For you to teach to other men, yes. who can teach it to other men also? Oh, that is duplicatable. Yes. He right. said, "What? What? You, if you're doing it scripturally, it will be able to be duplicatable." Amen. Can I tell Amen. you this? There is a whole lot of missionaries on the mission field, and they go over there. Uh, by the way, I could do it. I could take enough money over there if I had it. You know, and I could flash money around, and we could be running 500 in church services oh, under a mango yes. tree, yeah. easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everybody in Nigeria, now look, this is just the way it is, good, bad, or ugly. I don't know, but if uh, everybody there would love to have a connection with a man from America, mm -hmm. yeah. and it ain't about color, white, black, no, 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 anything about uh, about uh, America. They would want to be in a, in America. They'd like. That. Now, we had people we didn't even know off the street walk up to us and say, I would like to go to America. I said, why? <laughs> why? Did you? At the time, I said, did you know America is $21 trillion in debt? Why would you want to go there? You know? Look, you've got a wonderful country here. We love it. Why do we live here? We live, it, we live here because of God's will. But, but the idea there is we've got, we've got anybody. Uh, we were just knocking where we were trying. We were planting the church. Tapping the gates, because you can't really knock doors over there. You, they got compounds with gates and stuff, and, and, and even in poor neighborhoods. But anyway, you pound on the gate and hope somebody will come. If they don't come, you leave a track and, and go to the next one. And we were doing that one day, and it was a man, a big, tall, skinny fellow like, like Brother Heffington. And, and he saw us walking through the neighborhood. And that guy said to himself, he said, I bet they're Americans, and I bet he's a preacher. He was looking to, he's, he was a real estate agent type of a fella. He says, I need to meet that guy. He said, I want to find out where his church is. He went back the next day after we were done knocking the doors and, and he, he found where we had a, a little storefront building in a plaza and uh, my banner was on the door. We were meeting church on Sundays there. I think we would only about the two or second or third week that we were down there. He said, I'm going to be in this church this coming Sunday. He came. He got saved the first Sunday. Amen. And he's a pastor over there now. But you know, his whole reason for checking, for, for, for seeking
seeking me, see, he wanted a connection with somebody from America. If, he, if I can have some kind of an affiliation with an American, it means instant money. Well, he found out otherwise with me. But, you know, we just, you know, it's hard sometimes. But we would tell people, we, look, we do it differently. We do it better. We do it God's way. We do it scripturally. Yeah, but we know uh, somebody else has got a different missionary. And uh, they, they always get lots of money from the missionary. The missionary provides everything. Okay, that's not fair. It's really not fair to people that's doing it right, but we understand we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna fight against that everywhere we go. But the key is it's got to be duplicatable. Yeah. What you're doing if you go over there and flash the money so you can have big crowds immediately. Yeah. Guess what? The national pastor that surrenders under you that you train and you put him in that in that pulpit, the church plant, your church plant there. Guess what? You may go away. God may kill you. You may die. You're not here anymore. You get called home to be the executive director of your mission board or something. And that little fella, he's not going to be able to flash the money to help the other guy. There's another church plant that's going to be made out of this church. And there's going to be a little preacher there. And this guy can't do for that guy what you did for him if you don't do the indigenous principle. Because what most missionaries from America are doing, they're not doing doing something that's duplicatable yeah. it's well, just know. not duplicatable right. and, and and so guess what happens it depends on us the americans it depends on our money it depends on the supporters back home providing it all we got to do is usually put it in a prayer letter and somebody that don't know any better right gonna send money and we'll put it in our prayer letter that we're at 56 percent of the need of hundred thousand dollars or something and we'll get the money eventually and we're not helping anybody. It depends on us. And if God calls us, the government, Muslim government now, kicks us all out of the country, and that's going to happen one day, then there will be no more American missionaries there. Guess what? It all shuts down. Right. I know an American missionary that was there. I met him. In 2007, you met him too. The guy had about 20, some, between 20 and 30 mission, uh, uh, church plants. And he disqualified himself, just to stay out of the details. He disqualified himself. He's off the mission field now. He and his wife are divorced. He had six little girls raising them in Nigeria. And they're, I don't know where they're at now, but it doesn't matter. But I'll tell you this. 20 however many churches it was, all of them but two went out of business because the missionary wasn't there anymore. He wasn't there to prop it up. He wasn't there to pay the bills. He wasn't there to do all that any, anymore. And guess what? The buildings that they built did not look like Nigerians built it because Nigerians didn't build it. American money built it. Right. And it's the kind of thing that he was proud to take pictures of and put in his prayer letters. And what happened was when, they, when, when, when everything shut down, the only reason two didn't shut down is another missionary grabbed them and propped them up before they died. So he could claim them for his own, okay? Things like this happen, okay? Ah, I'm not just here to cast stones, but to tell you the truth. Right. Those buildings that were built by the American missionary were nice. Now, they, get, they fetch some money. And you say what you want to say, yeah, but these were men called. Called, got saved, got called of God, trained by a good missionary who put them in there in that place and they sold the buildings and put the money in their pocket. That's already, that stuff like that's already been mentioned once today, but I will tell you, it's more prevalent than anything that you know. Right. Yeah. They will sell that bill. That some of them are playing a long game. It's like a chess match. They're looking down the board some 15 or 20 moves. You can do that. You're a pretty good chess player, I think. But uh, but they're saying, look, look. If I just take this thing, eventually something's going to happen. It may be years. I might have to pastor this church 20 years, but eventually he's going to leave, and I can shut this thing down, and I can sell it with the money in my pocket. And they're willing to do that because the kind of money that one of those buildings will fetch, most of those Nigerians will never have that kind of money in their pocket in their entire life. Now, if you've done it right and the missionary didn't build anything and you, you have a congregation under a mango tree or something 
or just somewhere in the shade because shade a little bit important over there. And then, and you, you get it all, you, you get it going right. And eventually you got a young man and you put some time in him. You've done, you've trained him and you don't put a novice in there, but when he's ready, and you put him in there. And then eventually he's in there under the mango tree. And somebody say, preacher, you know what we need to do? We need a building. You reckon there's a building around here somewhere we can buy? You know, the missionary, da, 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 da. the missionaries already told us we're not gonna we're not gonna pay, we're not gonna pay for your building. So they'll start saving up money. They can do it. They'll save up the money. Then what we will do eventually is be able to either buy a building and kind of renovate it, knock a wall out or something, you know, or we'll build one. Amen. And we'll have and you know what? It won't look nothing like an American building. It won't look like an American building at all. It might just be a pole barn with a dirt floor. Just a way to get out from under the mango tree and still have shade. Yeah. It's not something that maybe you would th feel like you need to put in your prayer letter at all, maybe. But listen, those people be proud of what they got. Yes, then the, something happens to the missionary and he gets sent back to America. And what happens is they, uh, uh, this preacher says, well, I, I think I, what I'm, I'm going to do because missionary in here, he ain't looking. He ain't probably ever coming back. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sell our pole barn. <laughs> And the church member's going to say, him! You know what that means? Where I come from, that means that's, mm-mm. <laughs> him! We all sacrificed to build this right, building. Yeah, right, yeah. The Lord did it through us. You ain't selling it. Right. Amen. 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 And he can't sell it and put money in his pocket if he wanted to. Amen. Right. He won't have enough money to get... To, to make it worthwhile. It was just a pole barn, you know. He ain't going to get as much as that big nice man. We went four and a half hour drive. By the way, I don't even know if I'm going to get to my notes. We went a four and a half hour drive to do a building dedication in a village called Angwan Malam. It was the end of the road. We got to that village. There was like, that's the end of the road. It just kind of went into the middle of this village where the huts were everywhere. And then all around the all around that village was uh, uh, peanut fields. They call it ground nuts, peanuts, ground nuts. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I asked a little pastor fella. I said, what's further that way? There ain't no more road. What's further that way? He said, more villages. I said, what's that way? More villages. What's that way? More villages. How you get to them? I don't know. But they're everywhere. They're everywhere. This guy was the end of the road. It took us four and a half hours to get there. We got there. We're trying to get back by dark, and we didn't make it. But uh, when we got there, there was a little mud brick hut with a tin roof. I mean, they made the bricks themselves out of mud. The mortar was mud. I know what you said about building and mud, I mean, uh, c concrete and the mortar and stuff like that today. But th they were proud of their building. I'm serious. And you know when they were building this thing and they're breaking the bricks like you talked about, the little piece they didn't use, they just threw it on the inside on the floor because it was kind of just a dirt floor and they had built it up a little bit and the floor was eventually going to be about a foot higher than the dirt and it... That's what they, they put the broken pieces and, and, and the, the, the uh, construction materials. When we went to do the dedication of that service, we had a dedication service under a mango tree because you couldn't use that building yet because everything was so rough. You couldn't even walk in there without breaking your ankle or something in that building. Okay? Well, eventually, they was going to fill it up, backfill it with dirt and have a dirt floor. They hadn't done it yet. I mean, things take time when you're, the natives are doing it themselves. Right. But I promise you this, no pastor or no future pastor is going to sell that building. Right. That's the people of that village that got saved. Amen. Somebody did a good job. That little old preacher, he was just a little twerk of a guy. He was littler than me. And he, was, uh, he did a good job of winning his people to the Lord. Yeah. They were genuine. They were, they were fantastic. I said to my wife, this is true Christianity here. Yeah. This is Bible yeah. Christianity. Christianity Amen. here. Amen. Amen. I said, uh, uh, and guess what? Their village is more everywhere. Everywhere. I don't know how they got to them. Uh, American can't get there. But you know, some little boy can come up in through that church and surrender to be a, a preacher and be sent from that yeah. church to another village somewhere else where they ain't even a road. Yeah. 
They can take a little motorcycle and go out through the range, you know. But I'm telling you that if it's done right, it's duplicatable. I don't care who you are, where you're at in the you're world. Right. Amen. Years ago, the very first year we ever went to Jamaica, you weren't even old enough to go yet, probably. But when we first went to Jamaica, the little missionary that we stayed with, he was there maybe the first four years that we went. We stayed in his home. And he said, we've heard about a church somewhere on the island. And he says, we're going to try to visit that church Sunday. What do you think? I said, I think it's a great idea. And so we found, we, he went and he, he had to kind of drive around out in the middle of a, almost like jungle. And it wasn't up in the mountains because that's where we usually went. We loved the mountains. But this was down in a coastal range on the south end of the island somewhere. I couldn't take you and find that building today. But when we got there, it was a building Long is probably from that wall to this wall and, and I don't know, uh, commensurate size, somewhere right, like about, uh, about right here. And it was just one big pole barn. It had where they, a little bit at a time, were putting some concrete block around the edges. They, they concrete blocked the backside where the pulpit's here, so they had a concrete block wall all the way to what eventually is going to be somehow tied into a, a gable roof going this way. And they had about two rows of block going that way way two rows blocking none on that side yet and they were doing it a little at a time just as they for as you know i had a little building fund or something and though they'd throw a little jamaican dollars and jamaican dollars are now about 70 of those jamaican dollars to one u.s dollar but they'd throw their little coins in there and uh, eventually they save up enough to buy a few more block and they'd have somebody kind of one of their church members or something lay a few more blocks and eventually, and the building may be finished now, I don't know where you can find it. I asked that missionary, he said, who planted this church? He said, I don't know. I said, uh, I said, have you ever asked the pastor? He said, no, but come on, we'll go ask him. They asked the pastor, he said, who planted this church? He said, I don't know. Uh, nobody ever took credit for it. He said, no, no American did this. Oh, no, no Americans even know about this till y'all came. He said, here's somebody that's doing a great work, indigenous, yeah. and nobody's taking credit for it. How about that? How about Jesus that? did it. Amen. Praise God. I said, wow, you know, this is, this is really great, you know. Uh, but but uh, where we were on that island, I have no clue. Anyway, but these kind of things are working, and it's duplicatable. There's somebody, probably an American missionary or something, that went to that island, led somebody to the Lord, maybe planted a church. If they did it right, somebody, that pastor of that church, led other people to the Lord and planted other churches in different parts of the island. And nobody even remembers how it happened, but it was duplicatable. You're right. You're right. You're right. There's only one way to do it where it's truly duplicatable, and that's the indigenous principle. Anything else is less. And you know where it all got started? Up until... World War II. America was not a wealthy country. Right. We were up and coming with, coming with huge potential. But after World War II, there were two superpowers for a while. And there was a, a race for, for supremacy uh, in the world. And, and America became a very rich country. Amen. And because of one of our presidents that stood up at the Berlin Wall and said, Gorbachev, tear down this wall. They did tear that wall. The Soviet Union collapsed. We were the only superpower. And we, as a government in America with a lot of money, became the kind of thing, entity, that just, whenever there was a problem, we threw money at it. Yeah. Threw money at it. Threw money at it. Threw money at it. And you know what happened in the independent Baptist movement? And I don't care about the rest of them. I don't know about the rest of them. But in the independent Baptist movement, we kind of took the lead of the government and started applying it to the mission field. Yeah, because we're rich. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we can raise the money, and we can do it wrong. We can throw money at problems. It's it's easy to go over there and build buildings. You'd be shocked how really cheap for us it is to build them a building yeah. they'll be really happy with. Yeah. You know, but the idea there is is that we we got to doing it like America would do it instead of like the Lord told us to do it. Amen. Right. And now nobody even remembers the indigenous principle hardly anymore. Right. 
Right. Brother Crumpton and them were old school and taught some of us to another generation. And I didn't know anybody else in the country still even believed in it anymore. And I said, but I told somebody one time, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to keep preaching it. I'm going to keep teaching it. And the doctrine of Brother James Crumpton and the old Maranatha Baptist Mission Agency, it, uh, the mission board, is going to continue until I die. Amen. And guess what? Found out there are some others. Amen. And we need to have a revival. Yeah. This is the kind of thing that we need. Amen. Amen. And we need to have them more than just in Salem, Indiana. Right. Yes. Right. We, need to, we need to coat this country somehow. I don't have the idea how to do it. I don't know how to do it. But we, it needs to be taught and it needs to be put into practice. And you know how much we could have done since World War II if we'd have stuck with the, with, with the uh, indigenous principle? The same amount of money done right, duplicatable. Yeah. Every missionary that's ever gone from America that went somewhere and uh, planted a church and didn't pay for everything and trained them and taught them right Amen. and let them Amen. do it. And yes. that only thing they know to do is do what they were taught to do. But they cannot do the unindigenous way. They can't do it even if they're taught how to do it. They don't have the resources. Right. They don't have the money. But if everybody since World War II that ever went to the mission field did it right, you would have duplication after duplication after duplication, two or three generations of That's that. Right. And from uh, the same amount of money, we, America, could have changed this world. God blessed Amen. America with the resources mm. and the freedom to do it, and we failed him. Oh, yes. You're right. Yes. He blessed us with the word and with the wealth to win this world of Jesus Christ. But because we forsook the indigenous principle, nobody's teaching it anymore hardly. You don't go to any Bible college and listen and they teach the indigenous principle. If it are, it's, it's just a sideline, a little like he said, about one paragraph in a something, whatever. But if we get back to it, there is if there's any chance of really when in this world for Jesus Christ in these last days, yes. it's the indigenous principles. Right. That's, right. That's, the only, right. that's the only way it can be done now. I wish we could be redeeming the time. I wish we could go back to uh, 1945 and start over and do it all right this time. But we can't do that, can we? Whatever redeeming the time is, we need to do it. And I believe that's the indigenous principle. I believe we need to get back to it. I believe we need to do it right. Sure. And you know what? This was my notes here. Love must be tough. Yes. Love must be tough. Yes. There are going to be times where the nationals will unwisely ask the missionary for things. And you've got to be diplomatic, but you've got to say no. Right. We don't do that, and here's why. Right. You're going to the mission field. Let me just tell you this. You must build your congregation and you must, hear me now, you must teach them tithing and giving. Yes. Amen. You must teach them tithing and giving. Amen. Right. It's Amen. not optional. I talked to one missionary who was down in Paraguay. He went and worked with another missionary for the first couple of years he was down there, and he told me, he said, at the end of about two years, I was ready to branch out and go on my own. He said, I had words with the first missionary. He said, I... I asked him, I said, now I've been here almost two years and we've never passed the offering plate in our church here on the mission field. And uh, the pastor said, yeah, but these people are poor. They can't give. You've doomed them to poverty. That's right. Yeah, right. right. You've doomed them Amen. to a life of poverty. Right. Tithing and giving will work anywhere in the world. Yes, they, there, there'd be a, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, an economy of scale. Sure. But God will bless those people just like he blessed you and me. Right. Tithing and giving. Amen. If they are to build their own building, somebody's got to sacrifice. Yeah. And as they sacrifice, especially, listen, if somebody teaches them missions, giving a faith promise or something like that, most bang for the buck mm -hmm. is when you're giving the missionaries are going and winning souls on a mission field. You know what? We could win a lot of souls in Africa, and I can get two or three saved a year here. Where the bang for the buck, do you believe that God blesses 
It's, doesn't the Bible say something about that you're, you're, if you give to a missionary that that's fruit that will abound to your account? Uh, yeah. That's what I call bang for the buck. There's more bang for the buck if your dollars are going to help the mission field yeah. and somebody went and sold somewhere on the mission field. Amen. There were times that my wife and I, we'd get in about one school a week. I could get in a school that has a chapel every Friday after the last class. The last class on Friday, they would have a, 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 a chapel service. Now, they called it church, but it ain't church. You and I know that ain't church. I called it a chapel. The typical school that we would get in, they would have a chapel, and it wasn't compulsory. Nobody had to go. It was at the end of the day, the weekends lying ahead. <laughs> they'd have 20 or 30 go to that chapel. They weren't. Nobody made them go. But when they heard, Americans are going to be here. The same chapel last week was 20 or 30, was 300 and something, maybe 400 and something. One village we were at, by the way, we lived near the city, but all of our work was done in the villages. And those villages, some of those village schools, man, they would have four, there's one school at 444. And, and we were in 94 different, 94 schools altogether, and we preached over 16,000, okay? Preacher said, don't give you numbers. Uh, we preached 16,000. I know about how many said they got saved. How many really got saved? I don't know. But it was exciting, wonderful, and we have nothing like that over here. Right. Bang for the buck means missions dollars to me. And if you give to missions, God blesses you more than any of your other giving. By the way, you're not giving a dime until you're at least tithing. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. right? Amen. Giving is above your tithe. That's right. Yes. Amen. You must teach the people on the mission field tithing and giving. And then they will be blessed of God. Amen. You know what Nigeria needs right now is somebody to organize the very first independent Baptist mission board. I know a young man right now that's called of God to be a missionary to Cameroon. He would like me to help him. He's pressed hard. He would like for me to help him come over here and come around to some of the American churches like the Filipinos do. And they're going to go to the mission field with American money. I said, no, 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 no. We're not going to do it that way. I said, maybe God's called you to Cameroon, but really what God might use you to do is to be the one to start the mission board. It's 200-something independent Baptist churches now in your country. A guy like you that's called of God to the mission field ought to do it the same way that we did it in America. You travel around your country and tell them where God's sending you to go, and maybe they'll get behind you and support you. Man, over there, it might just be a 1000 an hour a month. You know what that is? About $2 a month. But you get about 20 or 30 people doing that. You can live in Cameroon as cheap as you can in Nigeria. You, but it's got to go through a mission board that's indigenous. I believe it needs to be a mission board where uh, it's collected by somebody trustworthy. Good luck finding that. And it's got to be where you can, they can have a banking system that works with the other bank in Cameroon where you can get your money. I, I, don't, I don't have the answers how to do it, but that's a young man right now that needs to be on the mission field and those churches in America should be able to give faith promise dollars to that man to go over to, to uh, Cameroon where they're in war right now and to do a work over there that God will bless them for. Amen. God will bless Nigerian Christians just as well as American independent right. Baptists. Amen. Right. Amen. Now, by the way, if I didn't believe that, I'd quit. Amen. I'd go back home to Vicksburg. Amen. Right. Amen. By the way, you're always welcome to come to Vicksburg. Amen. Amen. I'll, I'll even take you on a tour of the uh, Vicksburg National Military Park. Amen. I'm an expert at that. <laughs> that and five bucks might get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Maybe. <laughs> but I just, I want you to know that, look, I believe we need a revival of the indigenous principle. I know I've gone longer than I need to go. But praise the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, please Lord bless us. Lord, help us to get a passion and a conviction across our land. Lord, we thank you for individuals, maybe just a few in here, that have that conviction that it's got to be done right. So much more can be done for you, for your cause, for the cause of Christ, Lord, if we do it right. I pray that, Lord, you'd bless us. Help us to get that revival, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Preacher, amen. Where you at? I wonder if there's, uh, especially young preachers or young missionaries, uh, maybe you have some questions in your mind saying, how do we really start?
Does, is there anyone who's got a question, a specific question on what, if, if, if this is going to be indigenous, if we're not going to, how, how do we get people into a, to a place? How do we get them to meet? How do we, how do we assemble them? If, if we don't build a building for them and they don't have a building right away, then what do we do? Has anybody got questions in their mind like that? Wouldn't, wouldn't they naturally come into your mind? No? Right. The book of Timothy, where it uh, gives qualifications for a pastor, says he should be given to hospitality. So I would think that any church would start off with a Bible study at a man of God's home. Well, we, we uh, in, in China, uh, in, in Shanghai, in the, last, the last term we were there, I'm, I don't know if I told this today, but I, I don't remember what. Uh, yesterday, I think I mentioned it. We, we set up our home when we first got there uh, in, in 2006, began the last term there. We just didn't furnish the, we didn't furnish the living room. We just put chairs in there. All right. and, and it was a while, we just started, we gathered folks there. We saw folks saved there. And I said earlier, I don't ever use numbers. That doesn't mean we didn't have folks saved. I just didn't report. You know, <laughs> I, I used to say in my prayer, like, well, we saw some folks saved, but I didn't say we had 10 saved, 20 saved. You understand what I'm saying? So we gathered in our home and it was an apartment. We had, a, we had enough experience in China to know that they were going to have to meet in apartments. They didn't want to go back. All right. So it, but, but still, do you, know, do you know what happened? Do you know what they did? <laughs> they came and said, they came and said, we, uh, preacher, we want to help pay the utility. We're using your house. We want to help pay your utility. That's the Lord. Amen. I mean, they already were getting the idea that they were responsible. Mm -hmm. That's that's the issue. And so, it, after a while, well, we probably had my goodness. See, I don't. I'm not giving numbers, right? So I don't want to tell you the number. <laughs> we probably had 125 meeting in that living room. And then the men came and said to me, "You know, for security reasons, we need to move." And so they went, this is what, this is exactly what happened. They went out. I didn't go. I didn't go with them. I said, go find a place. They went and found an apartment that had actually three floors. And they came back and they said, you know, Prisha, you're, you're going to be in danger too. So come with us. Come we, what we want to do is rent that. We're going to pay. We're going to pay for that, um, and um, we want your family to live on the second floor. There's enough bedrooms there. Your family can live there, and uh, there's a kitchen downstairs and a meeting area, and it's in a safer place. And we want you to be safe place, uh, safe too. So we worked out what the what the rent was, you know, and we actually paid them to live there on the second floor. They paid the, they paid the owner, all right, the whole amount, and we just paid for that second floor. We, we gave the money to the church. And now they've moved, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Matthew Murray, twice since then. I believe so, yeah. Twice since then. And Matthew knew that. Matthew knew that place. You were third, second or third place when you came down. Sir, second. In where we lived on the okay. And uh, so, uh, but each time I I'm not the one that made the decision. They made the decision. They decided. By the way, they, you know they could figure out their own level of security. What they needed. There better than we could. Sure. Mm -hmm. 
they'd come to us, you know, and say, that we're, this is going to get us into trouble. That's going to get us into trouble. There was, uh, there was a period of time when um, the, it was under surveillance to the point, I'm not sure you had come from Inner Mongolia yet, Matthew, but maybe you had. And we actually went out to some parks and actually met in some parks. Were you there at that time? And we could not meet in our meeting place because the folks knew that they were being watched. And they came by and said, we, we need to kind of lay low for, you know, as far as our location for a while. And we actually met in several different parks for some Sundays until they came around and said, preacher, we think it's cooled down now. Go back to the apartment and meet. I didn't even make those decisions. I wouldn't even known to make those decisions. You know, they hear all the chatter, and I would even if, even if even if my language level was excellent, excellent, I still wouldn't have heard a lot of that chatter. I wouldn't have known what to listen for. They knew what to listen for. But the but from the very beginning, we were teaching them. This is this is the Lord's work, and this is your you are part of it, and it's not our work. We've said it over and over. I, mean, I don't know how many times we had to say it, you know, but it's that's that's the way it started out, and that's the way it was everywhere we've been. So the matter is teaching them, Brother McGuffey just said it. Go to teach them. Go to teach them. And I use that second Corinthians, second uh, Timothy. Two, two passage about everywhere I've ever been preaching. If I preach more than three or four times anywhere, I usually get there Man. Yeah. to Second Timothy chapter two. And Adams, he he can, he's our he's one of our members. He's shaking his head because I'm always telling I'm always telling young preachers, look, you need to be prepared to teach others. Yes, what you've learned from that book, you teach. Others, you teach faith, and you're not required to teach unfaithful men. It says teach faithful men. Amen. And you you need to have the discernment to know the difference so that you don't waste all your time and energy and breath. Mm. And then go on, and, and you want to teach men that are going to be fa that are faithful and will teach others also. Yeah. Amen. Take Let it go down the line. And I, I preach that in China, preach that in Philippines. I'd like Brother Thurman to come. We're going to, uh, we've still got some time before five. These preachers are short this year. <laughs> I'd like him to come, and I asked him if he'd just give a testimony. And um, he's, uh, he's done a lot in India, and he's worked with men in the, <coughs> also in the Philippines. And you've met. Even some of our folks from China. Gideon. Yeah, Gideon. Okay. So I asked him if he'd give a testimony. And bless me. You want that? No, I don't. You want any? You don't want that? I can. <laughs> yeah, I want. I want to hook you up so that we can get the recording. You have to have some evidence. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mess up pretty bad. You might want to re review that. I'm an evangelist that has volunteered to do mission work. That's not, uh, no missionary is out of one penny because of my presence. And that's a shock to a lot of the missionaries that are in foreign countries. But uh, we're there to help. And every one of us can have our part in helping missionaries, not just through giving, throwing money at it, but we can help by just praying for them, but we can help by being there. I know men and women that have, in their retirement age in America, they didn't have to go out and raise a bunch of deputation money. They were set. Mm -hmm. And so they, they supported themselves to go to foreign fields because they had pensions, or they had retirements, or they had social security. Mm -hmm. And they used that and they supported themselves and, sent, and were sent out from local churches in America. We don't have to have all the rigmarole. That's right. that is, but there's, that's to help.
But if you're going to stay there, you need to you need to be sent and and under the authority, yes, oversight. Yeah. Let's put it that way, uh, of a local church, of course, but and other missionary agencies. But what God put on my heart was uh, the Bible says in Hebrews uh, seven twenty five. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession yes. for them. Yes. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. That's what we're supposed to, we're supposed to duplicate Jesus. Right. So what are we sending? What kind of people are we sending to the mission fields? We've got to have a testimony. Right. We've got to have character. Right. And uh, that's hard to find. And you've got to bring people. It takes a lot longer to build a missionary nowadays than it did even 20 years ago. Uh, I know when I first started preaching 47 years ago, pastoring a church, that uh, I could knock doors and talk to somebody, lead them to the Lord, and they, they made good church members, get them baptized. Mm -hmm. They had character. They had morals. They knew the Bible a little bit. They didn't know much. But uh, they were already taught right. They knew had discipline at home, and you didn't. You you could stick them right into something. But today, if you win somebody to the Lord on the bare minimum information that you can get to them, it takes years to build them up their character and their testimony and their knowledge. But we, we've got to send missionaries that are holy and harmless. I remember many times talking about being an American and. They just want to tie their ministry to an American. I get calls all the time. Next time you're in India, next time you're in Brazil, next time you're in Philippines, next time you're in Haiti, oh, would you come and see our work so, or do a crusade with us or something like that? And, and uh, so they can get their name attached to an American missionary or evangelist or something like that. But uh, the indigenous people know if I'm there, Many times as we go into villages, especially in the primitive areas of India, in the cities not so much because they're westernized, but out in the villages where the uh, every village is controlled by either a, a communist group or a socialist group or a Catholic group or a Muslim group uh, or a, a Hindu priest that's powerful, each one you got to pass their inspection as you go into the into the villages, and the indigenous people know which ones to say. Get down on the floor, put down. We don't want them to see you. Cover up. Yeah. They'll throw things over my white face, and uh, or we're driving down the road and and listen. In these foreign countries, my my gut won't take a lot of the food that's served me, but in India and in the Philippines, year round you've got three crops. And I lived on watermelon. I'm telling you, if I couldn't eat anything else, I could eat their watermelon. And uh, but if they saw American in that car or American in that van, it was double or triple the price. So many a time, you know, they'd say, "Get down." I think they started liking covering my face. <laughs> but uh, so I started covering it myself. But <laughs> nevertheless, in in Brazil, when you you have a church you can't buy ground in most of the big cities uh, some of the missionaries work with there but they take the whole floor the pastor will have an apartment on the 36th floor but the 37th floor is the church uh, and, and they can't get the buildings right and so they've learned to learn to do that and of course in some of the primitive areas whoever's controlling that village in India uh, it's not as bad as China, of course, because it's not communist. They brag about how they're a democratic republic like, like America, and they have got constitution and everything. <clears throat> but uh, it's still illegal in India for me to proselyte or to convert someone from one religion to another. I'll get thrown in jail. I've got friends that have been thrown in jail. Uh, a man from uh, Goldbug, Kentucky, Bob Jones, uh, was thrown in jail because he converted somebody in a public place and he had to go to jail. And so he witnessed to the judge and the judge, the jury and the judge. He witnessed to everybody there. They finally got rid of him because he was just witnessing too much. But uh, either, either way, I preached to thousands in India, 
but I can't go out there and do it. They've got the cameras, the news people, or people coming in, and, and the, the agents are out there checking you out and listening to what you say. And so I'm preaching the gospel, I'm preaching the Bible, I'm preaching as hard as I can for 45 minutes, or, well, an hour, I'll be honest with you. And, and finally, when I'm done, I step back and I go talk to the agents that are there to investigate, and I talk to them and say, see, I didn't convert in anybody, but we sent a hundred young men with their open Bibles out of the congregation, and they're winning people to the Lord and taking them to the rest of the way. I didn't do it. But you, you find a way, but the nationals know what you can and you cannot do, how far you can go, when you need to have your face seen, when you don't need. But one of my, my goals as a missionary is I don't, want to, I don't want the place to be worse because of my presence. Right. In some places I preach, just being an American will get you in trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in Mumbai, Bombay, I, many in, the, in the hotels, in the airport, the, the Muslim, Muslims were riled because President George Bush had just landed in India, and they burnt the Taj Motel. They, they were at, uh, into our airport. I hid among uh, some Muslim, Muslim families and, and spoke French. <laughs> They're looking for American passports. Those people protected me. Uh, I don't know much, but that's all. I lost a phone day, love it, three, illusion to glory, terrible. So I, if you can sing the French national anthem, you might give, you might give <laughs> fools to people. But um, e either way, so they know what we can and cannot do, where we can and cannot go. But the last trip to, to India, we, were, we could not chase down the local church. Because they were having to move so often. And we would call them on the phone. Well, we can't meet there because the Hindu gangs are there. And, and so but we find, finally found them. We preached to about 75 people. And we left. And we came back that evening and preached to more. And some other pastors and preachers brought their people in. And we preached to them. And I left. And the next day, 14 preachers got beat up severely. Mm -hmm. Because I was there. And so I want to be harmless. I don't want the fact that my presence drew so much attention to what these men of God were trying to do. And so we're, we're trying to find ways of ministering to them as pastors individually and teach them and some of the same principles we're talking about here. Yeah. But uh, there's ways to do it in the Philippines the same way. May I just give you some advice if you go to the Philippines? Don't think those monkeys are friendly. <laughs> I've been attacked by monkeys twice in India, three times in the Philippines. And a, 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 and a 200, none of your business pound preacher doesn't stand a chance against a 40 pound monkey. <laughs> That's right. I'm talking, he'll have both your eyeballs out. He'll bite your nose off. He'll, he'll take a hunk out of your leg. I know. Before you can even, that monkey bit me. I didn't even know he was there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, jumping out of the buildings, coming down on top of your shoulder, and reaching around, pulling. You know, I said, but the natives, yep. they know you don't don't go or sit under that tree. <laughs> America doesn't know. Right. I said, so uh, it's, what's a wonderful thing is to work with people from so many different societies, and many of them are influenced by their evil cultures, but to, to think that they, they know what they're doing. Yeah. And that's why the indigenous principle is so, so important it, that I can go over there and help them, encourage them, preach them, teach to them, and uh, show hospitality, somebody said that, and, and just, but some of the things I get fed in some of these countries yeah. uh, it makes your, your, your gut boil. I mean, it just, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just the water. It's not just Montezuma's revenge. It, I mean, it's, a, it, it's strange. When you find somebody that gets a bunch of minnows out of the creek, smash them with a big hammer, throw them in the fryer, throw them out, and they start eating them like potato chips. Uh, I, I, <laughs> And I didn't see anything clean either. <laughs> uh, I mean, just different things like that. But it's a, it, it's a wonderful thing to watch how these people 
bring me into their ministries instead of me making Americans out of them. Right. I don't know about you, but America's not shipping anything That's good right. out of the country. Right. Yeah. Our influence is not good. That's right. Right. <clears throat> not our Hollywood, not Amen. our TV. Amen. Amen. We're sending missionaries to the foreign people that have fewer standards than the people they're right. going to minister to. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Amen. So uh, it's a it's a joy and a cheerful. It just blesses you. Find a place. Go somewhere. Ministers of those people. Yes. Look, see what they're going through. But they don't need our money. But they do need us. Amen. Every ministry should have some oversight to it. I know many pastors say, when you're in this area, you know that area, would you please sneak up on our missionary and find out if he's really doing what he says he's doing? I said, I won't do that. But I will go by. I'll visit. I've only been disappointed one time. Yeah. Just once. Yeah. And I found I found the preacher in the back room drinking a beer. Mm -hmm. I said, you need to you need to confess that. You need to tell your missionaries, your mission board, you need to confess this thing and not do it anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell on you, but I'll be visiting your mission board to see if they can tell me what you've done. I, I, so most missionaries that are, we're sitting over there, they're, they're doing the best they can. But I'm just saying, we can help. We're all in the help ministries. You don't, have, you don't have to throw a million dollars. Well, you can to this mission board. I mean, you can you give them a million dollars. That'd be fine. But listen, there's a, there's a work for all, all of us to do in this country and in foreign countries. Amen. And you can take a vacation and, you, and make it a missionary. Make it a mission work. Right. Just go encourage these preachers. Just go encourage your, your families. We go and we buy gifts for the, the missionary, the wives, the children. We take them play. They've been in the foreign field for 20 years and they've never even seen the sights of the country. Right. right. Yeah. Right. And I get to take them to see the Taj Mahal. No, and they, they're 50 years old and they've never even seen anything like that. And it's their own country. If they come to this country, I put them up in my house and we take them to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. So where do I get the money? Oh. You folks. <laughs> Thank you. Now, have any, have any, have you thought of any questions? Missionary thought of any questions? What are, what's your greatest concern? You young missionaries that are maybe, uh, maybe on deputation or maybe just maybe younger or whatever. I'm, what are your greatest concerns with regard to starting churches? If you, if you understand anything about what you've heard today, do you have, do you have concerns about how you'll get started? Let me, let me bring this up. And, uh, would like maybe like really don't. We'll say um, thus far I agree with pretty much everything I've been hearing here today. One of my greatest concerns it's not necessarily a worry per se but earning the trust of the people they got microphone or something over the way so yeah. I can hear. I noticed I have bad hearing. How to earn the trust of the people? Earning the trust of the people in such a way as they will be willing to be receptive of the gospel. The, we're going to Hungary. The Catholic culture is completely inundated into the, the, the society of Hungary. It's so so much in into there. <coughs> Keep going. But earning earning their trust in such a way where they will be willing to not only listen to the gospel message, but actually be able to start believing the 
the gospel message when it contradicts many of the things that they are taught since they were a young kid. How did you become a friend of somebody here, brother? How did you become a friend, son, of somebody here? Is there a biblical principle for that? Yes. What's your question? Is there a biblical answer to your question? Uh, the, the, let me, let me give you the Bible yeah. answer. The Bible, the, the the Bible says he that had friends I'm showing him some sooner. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. The, the Bible says he that had friends must show himself friendly. You arrive in that country, you don't know a word of the language, you don't know anybody or anything. First thing you want to do is pray and say, Lord, help me to be a friend. What was Jesus? Jesus is a friend of sinners. Amen? Right. You can't separate, you can't back off from them. You've got to go from them. You've got to confront them. That's right. But you've got to confront them a lot of times before you can ever give them the gospel. You may have to give them a cup of coffee. Uh, you may have to give them a piece of bread. You may, you may have to just put your arm. You gotta, you gotta be kind to them. Real and if you never break the ice, that's what you gotta do. And, and really, I think that probably comes from prayer. Lord, you know where they're at. You know who they are. Uh, lead me to them. Give me a heart for them. And. Uh, if you'd be willing to do that. Uh, I've been listening to all this today. I'm, I, I'm at 76 years old. I took a split church three months ago. Half the people were gone before I got there. I didn't even know them. <laughs> they were gone. <laughs> and uh, one of them said, right here in this little town. So this is a mission field. Right here in, in this little town, 12, 1,500 people that we uh, are ministering in. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I don't know anybody. What do we do? We start knocking doors. We start telling people that Jesus loves them. And uh, just showing, trying to show them that we care. And, and, and that's the main thing. That, that's the main thing. We lived like Brother Bob and we lived in an apartment building. We started out in language school in the Paris area. We were there for a year and a half in language school. And uh, at the same time, I said, we're going to sit around and be idle and do nothing? No. We have missionary friends. I think every, everybody, if you can, is going to the country if there's a missionary already there. And he can be mentored for a year or two or three years. I, I think that's a great thing. Go out there by yourself. Get discouraged, just get disheartened. I think that's probably the greatest thing that we ever did. Paul worked in a team. Show me when Paul didn't have Timothy or Titus or somebody else there. Who's he writing to in all his epistles? He said he pampers for this one and that one and all. <coughs> and so he had somebody there to encourage them. Uh, and uh, if you're going over to a country like that, if you're a young couple or you're just a single fellow, whoever, whatever, you, you, you need to be with, with somebody that will help you to, to learn the ropes, as we say. Huh? And uh, that would, that's what I would say. I may, I may be wrong, Brother Bob, but uh, I, that, that's what I learned. That's right. and, I, and I'm grateful to my men. I found out that one of my mentors just uh, uh, a couple of years ago was in a nursing home somewhere here in America. If I could go back and meet that dear man who got it, kicked out of Czechoslovakia in 1948 and came to France and spent his whole life and ministered there. If I could go to that nursing home where he was still alive and could hug that man's neck and cry tears like I saw this dear pastor here this morning do with his wife, I'd do that. You, Bob, they, they came out with a word. I, I never knew this, but we were practicing it before the word ever came to me. A, a, a number of years ago, they called it bonding, B-O-N-D-I-N-G. And that's what you ought to ask the Lord to, to help. Hey, Lord, help me to bond with somebody. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I can go back after to France now for 40 uh, years. I'm going there in 1979. I can go back there today, and I'll have people from just about every kind of nationality and descent and everything that come up and hug my neck and, Salute me. Uh, 
because that, and keep your house open. I had a missionary couple. I'm going to share this tomorrow, but I'll go ahead and share it today. We had, we had a missionary couple that was with our mission in Natchez, Mississippi, years ago. We came home, and we were doing something like this, Brother Bob, and it came up about uh, what kind of rapport should we, as our dear brother just said as a pastor a moment ago, what kind of rapport should we, as American missionaries, have with the national people of whatever country we were working in. And we just shared with us, you talk about your home. I, I've been, I, I've started so many churches in a home, I don't believe there's any, I don't even believe there's anything but a home church anymore. <laughs> yeah. Six times we've had to start over, I think three or four of them was in, in the living room in, in, in our homes, you know. They didn't open their homes immediately. Right. Right. Yeah. One lady ran us out of our home, she ran us out. I said, Richard, when are we ever going to get a building? I said, when well, y'all want one. But we've been putting back uh, their tithes and their offers for three years or so it was. And finally, well, they said, got enough money, like you were talking about what you this morning at 60 something. We, I reckon they probably had 20, 15, 20, 30,000. We found an old garage building, man. And uh, don't refuse to take. Uh, Helping you get it. God sent the USS John F. Kennedy into Marseille, France. Them old boys that don't there can do electrical work. They can do it. They was only going to be there a week. Huh? The French people put up all the money for all the stuff that go, you know, the <laughs> finishing of the border, like you know, like, They put up all the money. And them American boys said, hey, we're tired of being pinned up on that uh, Kennedy, on that aircraft carrier. We know how to do this, we know how to do that, we know how to do this. It was a mission project for them. Amen. It only lasted a week. The French people, have, they were getting in there, they were trying to uh, teach them French, and they were trying to learn English from them and all. And it was such a, a, a wonderful camaraderie there that was built. And hey, I wondered about it. Hey, maybe God called some of those men. There was a man running a Christian service men's center today that was on the USS John F. Kennedy. He's right outside of uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, worked with him in the Marine. That boy running that Christian service center. He was aboard that Kennedy, and he got his taste. Huh? He got his taste for missions while he was in the United States Navy. But I can tell a hundred million stories uh, over 40 something years like that. Be open. Uh, be open. Let people, hey, best thing I can call it, one word. Transparent. Amen. Transparency. Wearsby said it right. After he wrote all them big series, he wrote a, his life story. He tied it two words. Be myself. You be you. <laughs> and let the Holy Spirit transform Amen. you. And let you be all he wants you to be. And you'll be happy. You'll, you'll, it'll be a good trip, son. Amen. Good trip. Any other questions? I'm not. We're not going to have another speaker, and you, we have a little time before dinner. So I'm, I'm looking for questions now. Did that answer your question? Did that help you, brother? Uh, I'll say that's about the. That's right along the lines of what I was thinking. What, what is building friendship with them first, getting to know them. <laughs> I can't think of could think of any other way to earn their trust, but that's still that's still my biggest concern. My biggest prayer is building their trust. You know, I'll I'll go about it previously way you're saying, buy them coffee. You know, spend hang out with them, spend time with them, try to get to know them. But it's still the biggest concern. So it probably will be when I'm there too. When I was in the Brazil airport, and I they, they protect that Portuguese language. There's yeah. no English anywhere, and nobody speaks English. <laughs> and so I, I just found somebody and just sat down next to him and said, English? No. Went down to the, kept, kept trying to find somebody that could speak English. And, and finally, somebody came over to me and said, you looking for English? 
<laughs> so God's way ahead of me. Yeah, Never no, forget yeah. that God's all, God's got an Ananias. I mean, not Ananias. Yeah. I, I call that Priscilla. <laughs> <laughs> he's got he's got them somewhere that you're going to be. Yeah. And you just smile and 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 give them Jesus. He does that work. He opens the heart. He's the one that does it. And that's it. I've only been in 14 countries, but every time, God, if I, if I was pleasant and didn't mope around, didn't I, and I wasn't an elite, I just want, I just humbled myself because these people were humble. In India and some of these Asian nations, they're very humble people, so they don't want some big shot. They want somebody that's, you know, right. yeah. Will curtsy and bow if necessary and, and let them be somebody. So you go out there and you treat them like somebody because that's how Jesus came and found you and me. Mm -hmm. Brother Don, you spent some time in uh, Budapest with Brother Pranger, did you not? Yes, sir. Now, how did, how did Brother, Brother Pranger doesn't, uh, I mean, that's not the first, he may be studying Hungarian, but his his language that he learned previously was Russian. So I don't know what he's doing with the Hungarian language, but what does Brother Pranger do to win? I mean, what, how does he make friends there in Hungary? I know he had to leave Russia and go to Hungary. So how does he how does he make friends? Actually, one of the ways he does it, he, he likes, he, pretty much every morning he goes for a jog, starts his jog and running around. <laughs> <laughs> and the different people he meets there, you know, he greets them, starts talking to them, and sometimes pauses his job to talk. So, like you're saying, he starts building that rapport, the friendship with the different people. So, that's what that's one of the ways he's been meeting more people. Is he just goes for a job through town? Yeah. yeah. Well, Brother Jimmy's good at making friends, so you, might, you get to watch <laughs> watch him. As Brother Gibson said, if you can work with another, you'll be working with Brother. Will you be working around Brother Pranger? Yes. Okay. So I think you'll have some good good help there. Yeah. Yeah, stick with him. That I, we mentioned to Brother Dean earlier that was here, Brother Brother Dean. Uh, served in Iran, and uh, he. We were talking about language. Some today at dinner, I was th enthralled with some things he was telling me. But um, you're probably aware, and others may not. But brother, brother Pranger uh, does a um, a. He writes out the scriptures every year, right? So does he do both language? I think he does both languages, does he not? Yeah, he's actually, uh, he just finished up last year, he did a, he wrote through Hungarian on one side, English on the other, so he had like, a, uh, he made his own English-Hungarian Okay, Bible. so he had done that in Russian, now he's doing that in Hungarian. <laughs> he, he, yep. he, he, write, he, he hand writes the scriptures. And he does that for himself. He does that for his own language. He does that for growing for his own growth. There's something, something about the hand and the mind, you know, writing it out. And uh, so, so I think I think you'll have good help <coughs> for sure when you're there. Yeah. All right. Hey, brother, can I ask? This? Yeah, absolutely. I had a man that was born in Africa. He was born to missionary parents. The only time he ever came here to the states. He was with Baptist Midmissions. He, he came, went to Bible College, seminary out in Texas. Then he went straight on to France. I asked him when I got to France in 1979, I said, what's the best thing I can do to learn the language? He said, get with the national. He said, there's a young man that works for the French post office in our church. Get him to come, let your wife cook him a meal. He doesn't have any girlfriends. He don't have a wife. 
said, you invite him over to your house. Once we, well, we were enrolled in language school, but I needed to learn the language. I asked Dr. Crumpton, after we'd gone through language, we, we'd started doing that. There was an institute in Toulon, France, that uh, one of my mentors uh, had the first work with the French military there in France, missions to military out of Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, but anyway, he uh, had a young preacher boy that they started a small mission church and a Bible institute at the same time. This young man from France, I mean, uh, the Frenchman in the Navy, he came to my house while I was still in language school because I wanted to learn how to preach in French as, as well as to and to speak, you know, French you do. So I had two different ones coming at different times like that, sort of like a tutor room, you know, getting help. And I would get him to sit there when I would be preaching for this. He, he would sit there and write down everything. Now, I didn't know want to be as indigenous as I could be. I, I, I wanted to know. He said, well, find out if that boy, what, what it cost for him to get on the bus and get to your house or what have you. Don't give him a big financial, but help him in a way that it won't be like you giving him a salary if you paying him to be your puppet. In other words, if I can be plain about it. <laughs> and uh, so I said, okay. So this year, my man would come about 35 miles, man, uh, from over too long to Marseille. He would come from there on a bus. And he would sit there when I'd be preaching. Well, he said, no, you, you say it in America. He said, I understand every word, but you've got to turn it around back. He said, this is where we've got to put it. And uh, because your adjectives always come after your noun, in, in English it's not that way. When we say a black cat, they say it, uh, 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 a cat black. I mean, that's the way Latin <laughs> languages are put together. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so he corrected me, corrected. Humiliated me. What was Jesus' ministry? A minister of what? No. I, 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 his disciples. He, he was, was a minister of, of suffering. Paul was. See what great things he himself. Sometimes the most humiliating, the most suffering time in a missionary's life, if he's got to learn another language, because it'll knock his socks out of your pride. Boy, it will. It'll just knock his socks out of your pride. Yeah. Well, I'm an American. I'm supposed to speak English, and everybody's supposed to speak English. If you don't speak English, you're just dumb. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nothing to you, really. But that's not the way it works. Yeah. Right. God's got to turn that thing around on And, and it come back to what I said this morning. He knew what he calls you to. And if his callings are not his equipments, what are they? Huh? That doesn't mean that we just don't study hard. It means we study harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, but there's some things that, some things God will teach you along the way. You'll learn them as you go on. Amen. You know, because, we, because we've said, several of us have talked about, not taking tons of money to automatically put up a facade of, of a church by just putting a building there. Uh, some might think that we don't believe you can help somebody with a with it by an act of mercy or kindness. That's not what we're talking about. No. Right. You can still you might spend a little money being kind to people, sure. right? Being a, if you ever want to hear a good message, it's comical to get Dean McNeese's. Uh, what is uh, what is so great about the Great Commission? How many have heard that? How many who know who Dean McNeese said? Get, get his message, what is so great about the Great Commission? And he'll tell you how he bought ice creams for boys on bicycles and all. And, and he's so funny anyway to listen to. You can listen to him for hours just because he's, he's just, you know, he's naturally a humorous individual. But, uh, but he's real. I believe Brother Dean's real. And I, I've been to that church in Lottie with that he actually spoke about when he, I mean, I, I was there with Gil Massengill doing a tent meeting with him and, and all years ago. And when we were home on a furlough 
and uh, brother, I saw Brother Dean work in Lottie, Florida as a young preacher, and he was as real as real can be. And um, I heard him preach that message. I, I highly recommend that message because he talks about that kindness. He talks about some of the things that you've got to personally give up. You've got to give up that pride. You've got to give up some things to, to get people to understand that you care about them. And Brother Gibson's already said that. But there's, you have good, There, thank the Lord, there are good men that have exemplified those standards. We can learn. We can learn. But that doesn't mean we go over there and say, we've got enough money to put up what you need for the next, because then you've got to, you've got to maintain that. And that's not a church. That structure is not a church. That's right. That's right. That building is not a church. This right. building is not a church. That's right. This is a this is a facility. I I know that uh, some of the older some of the older Plymouth Brethren used to put up, you know, when they build a simple building, they'd put the meeting place of. Right. Instead of call it saying church, they'd say the meeting place of. Brother Bob, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to put myself in the place of one of these young okay, men. There. Go ahead. <laughs> they, wouldn't you, would you say that the church at Philippi, that was the first church that Paul founded on his second missionary journey, would you say that that, that probably not one other than the church at Jerusalem in Acts 2, wouldn't you say that the church of Philippi, would you say, is not one of the model churches? Yes, it is. It is a model church. Look how it started. Where, where was the first meeting place? On the beach. Under a bunch of trees, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Amen. 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 Lydia. And then after Lydia gets saved, what, yes. what did she do? She opened, She said, here's my house, right? Yeah. yeah. And when Paul and Silas got out of jail, before they left out of Philippi, where was the last stopping place? Jailer's house. That's the right way, huh? That's the right way to do it. Amen. But most, it's like Brother said this afternoon, mm -hmm. we got so caught up in this numbers thing. Yes. With this high, I, excuse me, I've got to be careful. Dr. Howell, God bless you up in heaven, brother. All right. This high house movement. And all of this stuff, this high pressure, A, B, C, one, two, three, repeat after me, and all of that, we wanted to get great numbers. Yes. I went to France in 79. It was the height of that movement, 1979. But if you wasn't running 1,000 yesterday and running 2,000 today and 3,000 on the third day, you was wrong. And I was writing prayer letters, and I sent them to a missionary friend. When I mentioned a while ago, Dan Ferriance, who got kicked out of, uh, uh, of Czechoslovakia and came to France. And uh, I uh, sent Dan a letter. He said, brother, you about ready to quit France? He said, it looks like the kind of letters you're writing, you're so discouraged, disheartened. I said, no, I'm trying to discourage, and I'm trying to dishearten pastors back in the United States to think that I'm going to be able to build a First Baptist Church Hammond here in Marseille, France, that they've done it in 10, 15, 20 years. It take a hundred lifetimes over there. Right. Because I realized the culture of my people, I realized the mentality, I realized the fact that there were no churches, 20,000 Baptists amongst at that time 50 million people. <laughs> I mean, drive 150, 200 miles and find no church. And so I knew what I was up against. Huh? I knew those enemies. I knew my personal enemies, the world, flesh, and the devil. But I saw how Catholicism and all of this garbage had impregnated the minds and the hearts of those people and so materialistic as they were. I saw, I learned all of that. So you gotta, that's a lot that you got to learn when you go to a place if you're running up against obstacles, don't think that you made them. That things were made a long time before you yeah. got there. Those storm pits and, uh, and all, those Germans, when those Americans went ashore and so many Americans were wiped out on those beachheads, those Germans had not just started the day before pushing them back. They were already 
doing that. So we're in a, we're in a battle, huh? Yeah. It's spiritual warfare all the way through, son. It's going to be a battle. Yeah. But hey, yeah. every time a soul gets saved, yeah. if you have to labor like uh, Judson, if you've got to have labor like Taylor and see your first convert after seven or eight, ten years, hey, somebody might be writing books on your life later on down the line. Huh? Yeah. If you be just faithful in there, Bob, yeah, just stick right. in there. Right? That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Hey, mate. Just, I could say one word, let it get a hold of it. It'd be like that pastor right there. I saw you. You got to hold it in. Amen. Any, any other questions? All right. Well, I'm going to let you. It's, on, it's near five. We have do have someone that wants to go to Goodwill. <laughs> but uh, we're going to have dinner. And uh, let let the ladies we'll let you go so you can fellowship, and let the ladies get uh, food. I got another meal, and at seven o'clock we're gonna have a service. We'll meet out here, okay? We'll we'll come up into pews. We'll use the pulpit up there this evening, and we'll sing, and and worship a little bit. Amen. Rejoice a little bit in the Lord, and uh, we'll hear we'll hear preaching. And by the way, the. the Preacher tonight, brother, brother, I mean, I've asked Brother Gibson to preach tonight, Amen. and uh, he has liberty. He doesn't have to stick to any issue. I just want him to mind the Lord and preach to us. Amen. Just, just to help us tonight, any way that the Lord would lead him. Okay. So, and he no, no time limit. You'll be here till midnight. <laughs> If you are, thrill me. Amen. Just don't sit in any windows. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going to with my favorite issue. All right. Ministry. Uh, Brother Noah Gudger, would you ask the Lord to dismiss us and ask him also to accept our thanks for the food? Amen. And dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you in prayer. God, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to got together around uh, some good advice around the world. God, I pray that you please, Lord, help us. Lord, I pray that you please, Lord, bless us through. God, thank you for the hands prepared. God, I pray that you please help the service tonight. I pray that you please help your man, God. I ask that you stand and preach as God. You help, help every uh, song to be sung according to your will. God, we love you, God. Thank you for Calvary, God. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. 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 It's fellowship now, one another. Yes. Thank you.